Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, just want to ask if you can raise your hand and you uh, hear me. Thank you so much. It's uh, my pleasure. My name is Miguel Garcia Winder, and I uh, recently been appointed to serve as a Mexican ambassador and representative to FAO uh, World Food Program and IFAT. Um, it is really an honor for me to be here and share a desk with a new friend, but I hope it's going to be a long-lasting friend for many years to come, Ambassador Nosifo uh, from South Africa. Uh, I know she's going to keep me on track because I tend to be very excited about all the issues that have to do with agriculture and biodiversity. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for, uh, for uh, attending this second uh, session on this global dialogue, which is timely. Um, for many of you who attended this morning uh, the session, you will probably realize the importance and the diverse opinions and needs that we have to address the issue of biodiversity. Uh, biodiversity has to be uh, placed in the framework of the four betters that FAO is promoting. We want to have a better production. We want to have a better nutrition. We want to have a better nutrition a better environment, excuse me, and a better um, life. And of course, I think we need to put a fit better. We have to have a better planet, a better Mother Earth uh, that is um, hosting us um, in this in our lives here in, in its place. Uh, this afternoon, we, we will have uh, about 10 distinguished speakers. Uh, it's going to be unfortunate for uh, me and my co-moderator because we will try to keep time, uh, good, uh, good eye on time. And, uh, and unfortunately, we probably will miss some of the great ideas that these speakers want to share with us, but we are going to um, take advantage of much of them. Uh, we are going to be working on uh, the sustainable management of, uh, and of agriculture and the agro, uh, agro ecosystems, land camps, uh, landscapes and seascapes. The second, we will concentrate on the restoration of productive line, land and seascapes, including the possibility to learn from different, to, to different examples. The meeting is uh, being recorded and it will be uh, made public by FAO in FAO website. Interpretation is available in the six official languages of FAO, and I want to express my appreciation from, for the interpreters especially when you uh, guys have to deal with a person like me that doesn't speak good Spanish and doesn't speak good English. So I'm going to put you in, in, in severe problem, but thank you for uh, ahead of, uh, uh, thank you uh, for your time. Um, we really appreciate. Uh, we are going to do the same uh, processes that we did during the morning se session. We encourage an active audience participation. We have uh, more than 300 people connected and listening to us. Uh, in the uh, panel, you will find a key for question and answers. Uh, please put your uh, questions in there. We are going to try to select some questions and uh, raise them to the panelists so we can promote the conversation. Uh, to open the session, let uh, immediately uh, pass the floor to our next uh, keynote speaker, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Environment, uh, Mr. Debbie Boyd. Uh, Mr. Debbie Boyd is an Associate Professor of Law, Policy and Sustainability at the University of British Columbia. Mr. Boyd was appointed as a UN Special Rapporteur in 2018. He has advised many governments on environmental, constitutional and human rights policy and co-chair Vancouver's effort to become the world's greenest city by 2020. Uh, Mr. Boy, you have the, the floor for 20, uh, for 10 minutes. I, would, I, I wish I can give you the 20 minutes, but 10 minutes, 10 minutes uh, is what I, I have in, uh, we have planned for you. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, muchas gracias. Um, excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, just before I begin my presentation, I just want to share the fact that I'm living on the west coast of Canada, 
And as you know, we were struck by an unprecedented heat wave last week, breaking temperature records, 50 degrees in Canada. This has killed hundreds of people. Uh, the town where the temperature record was set uh, caught fire and was burned to the ground. And uh, I just want to say as a society, we must respond with greater urgency to the climate crisis that we face. But today I'll focus my comments on biodiversity, food systems and human rights, drawing on a report that I presented to the UN General Assembly last fall. Earth is the only planet in the universe, as we know, that supports life. This unique planet is home to an extraordinary biodiversity, from giraffes to gorillas, from insects to bears. And humans share DNA, the basic building block of life, with all species, indicating that we should view nature as a community to which we belong, rather than merely a commodity for us to exploit. As all human rights ultimately depend on a healthy biosphere. Without functioning ecosystems, which depend on healthy biodiversity, there would be no clean air to breathe, safe water to drink, or nutritious food to eat. You know, it's amazing to think that a handful of healthy soil contains billions of microorganisms, algae, bacteria, fungi, and more, that feed plants and protect them from pests and pathogens. Healthy ecosystems provide humanity with a renewable supply of wood, food, fiber, fish, and other goods. Healthy ecosystems regulate the Earth's climate, filter air and water, recycle nutrients, and mitigate the impacts of natural disasters. And yet, our activities are destroying biodiversity as a rate, at a rate unprecedented in human history. Wildlife populations have crashed 58% since 1970. The rate of extinction is hundreds of times higher than the average over the past 10 million years and is accelerating. An estimated 1 million species are at risk of extinction. Since 1970, the human population has doubled and the global economy has quadrupled. And of course, agriculture is the single largest contributor to the global biodiversity crisis, listed as a major threat for 85% of the species identified on the IUCN red list as threatened with extinction. We are eroding the very foundations of our health, livelihoods, and economies with devastating consequences for human rights. The COVID-19 pandemic provides a striking example. COVID-19 is the latest emerging infectious disease to spill over from another species to humans. More than 70% of these emerging infectious diseases in recent decades have been zoonoses, including HIV, AIDS, Ebola, and avian influenza. The growing risk of these diseases is caused by human actions that damage ecosystems, such as deforestation, land clearing for agriculture, the wildlife trade, and intensified livestock production. States, of course, have created many treaties and declarations promising to protect nature, including the 1992 Convention on Biodiversity. But there is a huge implementation and enforcement gap. States failed to meet any of the 2010 nature targets or any of the 2020 Aichi biodiversity targets. So states are not responding with appropriate urgency to the dire warnings issued by the world's leading scientists. On the contrary, states actually encourage damage to ecosystems and biodiversity providing more than $500 billion annually in subsidies that harm nature, which is more than five times what states spend to protect biodiversity. The degradation of ecosystems and the decline of biodiversity have profound consequences for human rights. Among the human rights being threatened are the rights to life, health, food, water, a healthy environment, an adequate standard of living, and cultural rights. Communities, and, and we know this, let me provide just a few examples. We know that communities that are protected by healthy mangrove ecosystems are less likely to suffer deaths caused by cyclones, thereby protecting the right to life. We know that healthy ecosystems provide a buffer against emerging infectious diseases, safeguarding the right to health. Insects, bats, and birds pollinate more than 75% of our crops, essential for fulfilling the right to food. And the destruction of ecosystems and biodiversity violates the right to a healthy and sustainable environment. Because of their strong dependence on nature, indigenous peoples, peasants, and local communities are disproportionately harmed by ecosystem degradation and biodiversity loss. 
At the same time, indigenous peoples, peasants, and local communities can make enormous contributions to conserving and sustainably using biodiversity when empowered to do so through recognition of their rights. So states need to apply a rights-based approach to all aspects of conserving, protecting, restoring, and using healthy ecosystems and biodiversity. The key here is implementing everyone's right to a healthy and sustainable environment. Well, Examples of the procedural obligations of states include providing the public with accessible information about the global nature crisis, ensuring an inclusive, equitable, and gender-based approach to public participation, protecting environmental human rights defenders from violence and intimidation, and enabling affordable and timely access to justice and effective remedies for all to ensure accountability. On the substantive side, states must monitor and report on the state of biodiversity, implement national biodiversity strategies and action plans, create protected areas and other effective conservation measures, enact legislation to protect endangered species, and restore degraded ecosystems. With respect to Indigenous peoples, states must recognize their land titles, tenures, and rights, acknowledging the existence of different customs and gov governance systems, including collective land ownership. Similar measures should be taken for peasants and local communities. And of course, businesses and large conservation organizations must do much more to protect human rights as well. In my report to the General Assembly, I also provided hundreds of inspiring examples of good practices in the conservation, protection, and sustainable use of biodiversity, including the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People, led by Costa Rica and France, the European Green Deal, and the African Great Green Wall. So in conclusion, states must implement carbon neutral and nature positive economic recovery plans. States must transform food systems to be just, healthy, and sustainable. Eliminate, uh, sorry, accelerate action to protect and conserve nature. Take urgent action to target the drivers of zoonotic diseases and do all of the above by respecting the rights of indigenous peoples, peasants, and local communities. It is not yet too late to respond to the global nature crisis, but time is running out. Our failure to conserve, protect, and sustainably use the Earth's ecosystems has catastrophic consequences for the enjoyment of human rights and exacerbates inequality. The leading scientists in the world today are calling for rapid, systemic, and transformative changes to address the climate emergency, address the climate crisis, and avoid future pandemics. With COVID-19, humanity is paying a terrible price for ignoring scientists' warnings. We must not make the same mistake again. And by employing a rights-based approach to food systems and conserving biodiversity, this is not an option. This is an obligation based on national and international human rights law. A rights-based approach will serve as a catalyst for accelerated action to transform food production, end hunger, ensure healthy diets, tackle the climate emergency, and protect nature. History demonstrates through the progress achieved by the abolitionists, by women, by civil rights activists and indigenous peoples, the powerful role of human rights in sparking transformative social change. Thank you for the work that you do and I look forward to the rest of the presentations. And thank you, Dr. Boyd, uh, for uh, such an illuminating presentation of your report, uh, especially the sharing with the audience on some of the examples and case studies uh, that reflect uh, degradation of ecosystems as much as uh, what opportunities we have uh, as humans in, on Earth in terms of following a rights-based approach. I would now like to uh, say thank you again and thank you to my co-facilitator, Ambassador McNeil. Um, I would like to invite our next uh, presenter. My name is Nosipo Ngaba. I'm the ambassador to South Africa, from South Africa to Italy, sorry, uh, San Marino and Albania, as much as I am a UN representative to the FAO and other UN agencies in Rome. 
Uh, I'd like to now invite uh, Ms. She, uh, who will be talking on the ways in which integrated land and seascape management can support biodiversity. Ms. She is an agricultural and natural resource economist and the founder of Eco Agriculture Partners and the co-founder of the Global Landscapes for People, Food and Nature Initiative. The floor is your, Madam. You have five minutes, over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, hello, honorable uh, ambassadors, ministers, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be with you today. And I have to say how inspired I am by this event. Uh, defining the roadmap for an unprecedented alliance for action on food, agriculture, and biodiversity. Um, the myriad, there are myriad agricultural practices now that we know about that not only meet food security imperatives, but also sustain or enhance wild biodiversity. The same is true for forest, fisheries, and pasture production. We'll hear a lot more about that later in the panel. And at the same time, that's not enough, what happens on individual farms and individual uh, uh, pastures. To sustain thriving populations of wild plant and animal species requires large landscapes that meet all their needs. This means protecting an adequate area of natural habitat and creating habitat and ecological networks in and around farms and settlements so that wildlife, small and large, terrestrial and aquatic, can find food, water, safe breeding areas all year round. Managing biodiversity and ecosystems well can in turn support thriving food production, ensuring the water resources critical for irrigation, protecting farms from high winds and floods caused by climate change, controlling agricultural pests and enabling new markets for sustainable products. This can only be achieved through collaborative action and spatial planning at the landscape scale by all the land and resource users and managers, what we call integrated landscape and seascape management. And that head goes by many other names. They work to align resource use for production, nutrition, environment, and a better life, the four betters, now and for a sustainable future. Their solutions are rooted in local economies, local needs, livelihoods, local politics and culture. Indeed, whole landscape approaches have been endorsed by the UN Conventions on Biodiversity, Climate and Desertification, by UN Habitat, the Sustainable Development Goals, and is now being discussed with the, uh, the UN Food Systems Summit. Already, farmers and landscape partnerships are playing critical roles in conserving biodiversity in places as widespread as the Mesoamerican Reef, Andean cloud forests, Kenyan rangelands, Sahelian savannas, and Asian mangroves. You'll hear a lot more about this today. Can you give me the next slide, please? This picture illustrates a landscape where a mosaic of different sustainable land uses strategically linked contributes to all of the SDGs in that landscape. But can this be done? Isn't it too complicated? It, indeed, it seems hard. Most of our existing institutions are still organized in silos to work on specific parts of a landscape, farms, forests, cities, land or water or biodiversity. But over the last few decades, mostly below the radar, thousands of local landscape partnerships have been forming. Why? They're, they're drawn together to face daunting challenges of resource degradation and competition that no actor working alone can resolve. If we want to scale landscape level action, we can draw on a very rich and diverse experience on the ground across the globe we have tested tools for action and seasoned leaders in farming, environment, government, business, and community sectors. Though they are quite diverse, all successful landscape partnerships have five key features. First, a multi-stakeholder partnership for long-term learning, negotiation, and action aided by a trusted neutral facilitator. Second, a long-term vision and defined goals for the landscape agreed by the partners. Third, promotion of agriculture and conservation practices that have both food and biodiversity benefits. Fourth, spatial planning to make sure that different land uses and practices have positive ecological and economic impacts on one another across the landscape. And finally, policies that support integrated agriculture biodiversity strategies with market innovations that provide incentives for farmers and other stewards of the landscape. Many landscape and seascape partnerships have already had remarkable impacts, but 
but they are up against enormous pressures of degradation, habitat loss, climate and market risks. And they receive very little, mostly short-term and fragmented support today. Three transformative actions can be taken by UN member states and others to unleash their power. First, establish government policies that endorse landscape and seascape partnerships explicitly and make it easier for agriculture, environment, and other ministries to align their strategies and programs to support those uh, landscape action plans developed locally. Second, institutionalize uh, technical services for landscape and seascape partnerships to train facilitators, build capacities, advance markets, and invest in research. And third, contribute long-term funding for landscape partnerships and shift flows of public and private financing from degrading investments to clusters of investments in landscapes that together will lead to transformation. Thank you uh, through, thank you. I, I, let me thank you all very much and I look forward to supporting the solutions being catalyzed by this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Sher. Thank you, that was a illuminating a presentation. Next, we have the pleasure to welcome Mr. Lucas uh, Garibaldi from the Universidad Nacional de Rio Negro, Argentina, uh, to talk about the power of pollinators. Mr. Garibaldi is a professor, a research scientist, and the director of the Institu Institute of Natural Resources, Agroecology, and Rural Development. You have the floor, sir, for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and to share with you some of our research about the power of pollinators. So as we have been listening in the previous two talks, uh, as a consequence of uh, conventional agriculture, the environment for life in general and for bees in particular is being degraded. This has consequences not only for bees, but also for the same agriculture that is degrading the environment for bees, as most of the crops benefits for animal pollination in general and bee pollination in particular to produce seeds or fruits. So this has consequences for agricultural production. In particular, uh, together with FAO and many universities all over the world, we have been performing during several years different type of experiments to understand how much crop yield can increase by improving crop pollination. And we have found an impressive result of 24%. So 24% is a lot. We can harvest 24% more on average per hectare if we manage in a better way crop pollination. Uh, when we talk about crop pollinators, not only managed bees are important, we have also found that we need a wild and diversity of bees and diversity of pollinators in general. And to preserve and promote pollinators in agricultural landscapes, we need also to promote the habitats where they live. So native habitats, that is natural and semi-natural habitats within agricultural landscape, they play an important role in our food production and food sovereignty, and we need to preserve them uh, to improve pollination and many other services that they provide to our livelihoods. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Garbaldi. And I would like now to uh, uh, turn to the fisheries sector where Mr. Ray Hilborn will discuss opportunities to protect biodiversity through sustainable fisheries management. Mr. Hilbron is the professor of aquatic and fishery science at the University of Washington. Now you have the floor, say, Mr. Hilbron, over to you. Mute. Five minutes, please. Okay, yes. Um, okay, thank you very much. Just confirming you can hear me. Excellent, um, we can hear okay, you very okay, well. Okay, thank okay. You. okay, excellencies, ambassadors, and distinguished guests, thank you for the opportunity to make this presentation on the role of fisheries management in protecting biodiversity. Uh, next slide, please. 
all food production impacts biodiversity. And this slide illustrates some examples, including my son in the upper right on his farm, attempting to keep any natural vegetation growing in a field. Um, this infographic from National Geographic shows the relative impact on the oceans of different threats. Note that fishing on the right in the yellow box is one of the least threats to the ocean. And this is very contrary, I would say, to most public perception. Next slide. Many species have been rebuilt by controlling exploitation and leaving habitats for them. These species pictured are icons of the wild, including bluefin tuna, wolves, and bears, and they have all rebuilt in human-used areas by controlling the exploitation. Next slide, please. Fisheries management has been shown to work where applied. Uh, this graph shows the average trend in abundance of stocks representing half of global catch. Abundance in blue has rebuilt after fishing pressure in yellow was reduced starting in the, 19, uh, uh, in the 1990s. Next slide, please. In addition to target species, other elements of biodiversity have been protected by effective fisheries management. Many forms of bycatch from marine birds and longline fisheries, dolphins in persanes, and turtles and shrimp nets has been dramatically eliminated by changes in fishing gear and methods. Next slide, please. Concerns about gear have been addressed. Next slide, please. Vulnerable in ecosystems are uh, of serious biodiversity concern, and they, they have been effectively protected where they have been mapped and where bottom contact gear uh, in, in those places has been, uh, has been banned. Next slide, please. A key feature is that fisheries rely on a natural ecosystem to be largely intact. And a difference between fisheries and agriculture is that that in fisheries we we essentially rarely if ever harvest the first two trophic levels the primary producers and the herbivores that feed on them and those those elements of the ecosystem are are largely unaffected by fishing next slide please in world war one it was recognized that fish from the ocean had low environmental impact because they rely on a natural ecosystem rather than a man-made ecosystem. Next slide, please. So effective fisheries management has been shown to protect biodiversity. It's been demonstrated across all major threats to biodiversity. Um, in the last 50 years, the fishery sector has gone through enormous transformations in production, management, and use. Um, clearly more targeted blue transformation is needed to feed 10 billion, a, a 10 billion world. Uh, fisheries are a way to provide food at low impact to biodiversity as a key element of the sustainable blue economy. We need to aim to join hands across, uh, all, across sectors to, pr to protect 100% of the oceans with effective fisheries management and use instruments such as the post-2020 framework to help us do this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you once again, uh, Mr. Hilbron, uh, for that illuminating uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to firstly remind uh, all participants that you have uh, the ability to put your questions in writing on the platform and you are encouraged to do so because uh, we'll put time aside as it is reflected in the program for you to um, uh, get an opportunity to speak and or at least write your questions so that uh, all the presenters can be uh, given an, an opportunity to dialogue and converse directly with yourselves. I would like to go back to uh, our earlier uh, presenter on the program, Mr. Jao Kampari, uh, who um, was having trouble connecting. Are you 
connected now, Mr. Campari? I, I am connected. Can you please okay, can, can you hear right. me? I can hear you very well. Let me then introduce you, you briefly. Um, Mr. Campari is a global leader in food practice at World Wildlife Fund, WWF, as it is commonly known, and the chair of the action track number three of the UN Food Systems Summit. His career in international development has focused on balancing agricultural production and conservation. Today, he will speak to us about uh, the actions uh, that are undertaken under the UN Food Systems Summit uh, track on nature positive production. Now, I would like to hand over to you, sir, Mr. Kampari. You have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to join the session. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak. I'm, I'm glad that it worked out well. Uh, let me start with a stark message. We are living in a state of planetary emergency. Human activities are destabilizing our climate and food systems and destroying natural ecosystems faster than they can recover. We are, in essence, undermining the planet's ability to support us, including by providing healthy and nutritious food for all. And this increases our, our vulnerabilities to pandemics and accelerates climate change. As we know, food systems are vital to the survival of our species. They nourish us, and healthy diets support our immune systems. Food systems are the biggest employer in the world, and farming creates opportunities to lift people out of poverty. But food systems are not on track uh, if we are to achieve the SDGs by 2030. So while food and land uh, use systems have a market value of 10 trillion US dollars per year, they generate hidden environmental health and inclusion costs estimated at almost 12 trillion a year. However, food is not just a threat to nature. It can be part of the solution to biodiversity loss. They can be a vehicle for rehabilitating nature and optimizing all ecosystem services. The overarching goal of Action Track 3 of the UN Food Systems Summit is to globally meet the fundamental human rights to healthy and nutritious food for all while operating within planetary boundaries. Action Track 3 focuses specifically on boosting nature positive production systems to halt and reverse biodiversity loss by 2030. We explore the ways to produce food in harmony with nature and provide enough healthy and nutritious food for all. To do that, our work is focused on three key strategies. First, we are all about protecting natural ecosystems from conversion and degradation. The second pillar of our work is to sustainably manage, sustainably manage our existing food production systems in land and water for people and nature. And thirdly, uh, we work to restore degraded ecosystems and rehabilitate soil function. These three strategies or the three pillars must be deployed together, and they will only make sense if they can effectively deliver sustainable production landscapes. In the past 10 months, we have gathered hundreds of ideas and distilled them into 12 clusters within Action Area 3, Action Track 3. All clusters have one thing in common, they help reduce and reverse biodiversity loss. Let me exemplify a few. We have a cluster on agrobiodiversity that promotes the use and achieve the long-term conservation of the astounding biodiversity, both between and within crops through more sustainable breeding and growing practices. Agricultural production and markets have tended to become more uniform. So diversifying more and more our food production systems improves resilience, outputs and the quality of growing environment, not to mention how, they, how much they can improve our diets. The second cluster is um, around transformation through agroecology and regenerative agriculture. Here we aim to achieve a paradigm shift away from a model of improving uh, production and maximizing produ productivity of intensive and known diverse food systems that create costly environmental health and social externalities and move towards healthy, resilient, equitable and sustainable food systems. The third cluster that we worked, um, that we are working on is the Global Soil Hub. And this hub is aimed to facilitate the adoption and scaling of restoration practices that improve soil health, 
in productive landscapes through investment and policy action to avoid the loss of this crucial natural asset without which we cannot meet biodiversity or climate goals. There are coalitions being built around each of these clusters and they are now being formed uh, with the participation of member states, but action must also go beyond the Food Systems Summit. We need to connect the Food Systems Summit to COP26, CBD, the Ocean Summit and all other UN conferences. We need to see a comprehensive and ambitious, ambitious target on food system transformation in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. We need a target that will ensure that by 2030, food systems support rather than harm biodiversity, unleashing their full potential to contribute to a nature positive world. We need to ensure that the web of life at the basis of food production, including pollinators and soil biodiversity is protected and restored. First of all, a food systems target should promote the transition toward agroecology and regenerative agriculture, in turn supporting healthy soils. Agriculture has long extracted from nature and, co and caused more, most of the world's biodiversity loss. Only by shifting to an approach of farming with nature can we achieve sustainable food systems and reverse biodiversity loss by 2030. But action on production is not enough. A post-2020 framework on food systems should also address the need to move toward healthier and more sustainable diets. Adopting flexible diets, which are high in, in, in health benefits and low in environmental impacts, could reduce wildlife loss by up to 40% and agricultural land use by at least 41%, while decreasing premature deaths by at least 20%. We need to transform we need transformative actions across the food system on the way we produce, share, and consume food, including reducing food loss and waste. We need actors across food systems to engage in negotiations on the post-2020 framework, and most importantly, engage in its implementation. This requires an adequate mechanism to bring together multiple stakeholders to develop and implement plans of action on biodiversity and food systems, and should be aligned with the post um, food System Summit follow-up mechanism. Let me finish by saying that we just have nine harvests left until 2030, when we are due to deliver the Sustainable Development Goals. That's just nine more chances to change how we produce food and what is av available to consumers. But the Food System Summit and upcoming Biodiversity and Climate COP present a unique opportunity to course correct for the sake of people and the sake of planet. We can and must take ambitious and decisive action to deliver an equitable, net zero carbon and nature positive food system. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Joao, has been a very inspiring talk. Uh, you, you brought some issues uh, about the future that we need to, to address. Uh, this is Miguel again. Um, uh, this has been a very exciting uh, session. I think we have gone through uh, the role of uh, biodiversity and agriculture, uh, the, the need of uh, better human rights to address these issues. Obviously, the pressing issue with beasts and fisheries. Uh, so it's in, it's in front of us uh, a field full of possibilities for us to, to change the world. Uh, we were going to continue as uh, the organizers have asked us. Uh, we are going to present two questions to start a poll, or two questions. I wonder if uh, the secretary can help me to show the questions on the screen. And these questions are not for you to uh, be tested later on today or for you to show uh, your loved ones how much you know about these issues. But the reality is to promote a conversation. Uh, promote a conversation uh, on issues that sometimes for all that are in agriculture are every day uh, present, but for people who work in other fields may not be as present. So this, this brings us the possibility to, to, to increase awareness of, of issues. The first one uh, question that we want to put for you to tell us uh, what you think is, what share of the terrestrial planet is intact in the sense that it is largely, largely natural in extent. 
allowing mammalian movement and connectivity? This is a this is a very important question because it tells us probably how much we have left to rebuild the, what we need to be. The second, uh, I, and we had two, three options, 20%, 40% or 60%. The second question uh, for conversation and coffee or wine, if you are in other parts of the world or tea uh, or breakfast, depending on where you are, it's what percentage of emerging infectious human diseases originate in animals? Uh, this is uh, obviously in 2018, 19, and 20 is extremely uh, popular, but it will continue to be popular in the future. Uh, and here we have 10%, 30%, 50%, 50% up to 70%. Uh, before, uh, I, you uh, answer and we compute the results. I would like to start uh, 30 minutes of conversation with our panelists, if you allow me. Um, obviously, uh, the topics and the subjects are so, uh, so fascinating, uh, not only fascinating, but so urgent uh, that we have to ask uh, ourselves, what are the next steps? Uh, for Dr. Boyd, there is a question that uh, was shared to us, and it's basically uh, what they want to know what um, the indigenous wisdom has inspired a growing number of air center laws. What are your thoughts on this emerging body of laws? Will this emerging body of uh, thinking produce a paradigm shift in the way we we approach the human right issue uh, that um, you brought into the conversation today yes Please, uh, very dr thank, thank you very much it's a it's an interesting question and of course we have the evidence on the ground there's compelling scientific evidence that lands which are being managed by indigenous peoples have healthier levels of biological diversity so really that that is a testament to the customary laws and traditional practices of indigenous peoples. These earth-centered laws that the question refers to are often referred to as rights of nature's rights of nature laws, um, pioneered in 2008 by Ecuador in a new constitution. And then other countries have followed that uh, by recognizing the rights of nature in legislation and court decisions in countries like Bolivia, Colombia, Uganda, Bangladesh, India. I think that um, this is an interesting approach, which does have some potential. Uh, it has potential both from a legal and a cultural perspective. From a cultural perspective, I think recognizing that nature has rights really forces us to rethink our relationship with the natural world. As I said in my opening comments, you know, we, we tend to perceive of, and we have treated nature as though it is a storehouse of resources for human consumption. Um, and recognizing that nature has rights shifts that and puts us in a position of recognizing that we are actually part of a community of life here on the planet Earth. Um, and in a legal perspective, I think the rights of nature has power. It is being used in some of those countries I mentioned earlier to change practices on the ground. And so that that does have potential. I do think that it's, it's, a, it's only recognized in law in about a dozen countries to date. So it has a long ways to go. Whereas if we look at the, the human right to live in a healthy environment, the human right to live in a healthy environment is already recognized by over 150 states around the world. And recognizing human rights is actually the easy part. The challenge is the implementation side. And so I would rather see us focus our efforts on implementing the right, the human right to a healthy environment, because that clearly must include healthy ecosystems and biodiversity, which we are so dependent upon. Thank you. Uh, uh... Thank you, Dr. Boyd. This has, um, I, I think the issue of implementation is not only applicable or to the human rights. We have a lot of things that we need to pass from the conversation to the action. And implementation is without any doubt the most difficult part. That's where, um, that, that's, that's where uh, we need to work more. Uh, there are some other questions that I want to uh, uh, share with you. And these are probably uh, mainly for uh, uh, Dr. Hilborn. Uh, and the questions that we have received, Dr. Hirborn, are um, 
what is your opinion on the ambitions in the draft of the 2020 uh, GF Target 2 uh, based on marine protection areas? I think there is a lot of work uh, going on to uh, protected areas in the oceans and recovering the, the ocean. And there is a very interesting question from uh, Uganda uh, who wants to know, how do you uh, promote sustainable fisheries production outside the ocean? What would you, uh, what would you recommend to, uh, uh, to the governments and to the society? Thank, thanks, thanks for that question. Um, basically, we, we know that if you manage fisheries well, and not just the target species, but the impacts of fishing on other species, um, you, can, you can maintain biodiversity and produce food at the same time. Uh, and you, you don't need protected areas to do that, that, that you can maintain biodiversity in human used areas, but with effective fisheries management. And uh, the protected area movement really has been taken from terrestrial ecosystems where human use like uh, industrial agriculture and human habitation is totally transformative uh, and applied to marine systems, which are fundamentally quite different in that we don't eliminate the primary producers, we don't eliminate the primary herbivores, we tend to rely on the on the higher trophic species. So I don't I don't see that the protected area is is how we're going to uh, protect biodiversity in the ocean. It's taking the techniques we know protect biodiversity that I talked about in my presentation and applying them to uh, all of the world's oceans. So we need to protect 100% of the ocean, but we do that by effective fisheries management, not by banning fishing. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let, me, let me ask, uh, there is a question for Dr. Uh, Scher. Uh, Sarah, uh, the landscape approach seems to be uh, a very progressive approach, uh, a, a, an approach that uh, forces of, us to think outside the, the silos and create it in a holistic manner of all the resources, you know, the ecological resources, uh, historical resources, cultural resources. How, how can this approach be effectively integrated in the post 2020 agenda. Uh, thank you very much for that very central question. Um, I, I think that there's three things to be thinking about now as we're, we're, we're basically jointly crafting the post 2020 agenda. I would say the first one is to see these landscape partnerships as critical allies and actors working with them, give them a voice, find them, they're often completely invisible to actors that are out there to see them as a constituency who will help to co-create the, the policies and programs that will actually help them to work out these conflicts that are there within the, within the landscape. So that would be a, a first thing. Secondly, is work to provide them with tools. Already the CBD, FAO, many actors uh, out there have developed the tools that they need. It's very difficult for groups to get them. The 1000 Landscapes for 1 Billion People initiative I'm working with is, is trying to get those into the hands of every single landscape partnership. And I think this is the kind of thing the CBD can really facilitate. And thirdly, we've got to rethink the way funding flows. And there's three pieces to that. One is these landscape partnerships are doing what we call in the United States, they're having bake sales. That's how they're getting the money to actually do these complicated facilitation activities, integrated landscape assessments, planning the visioning, uh, identifying the practices that will benefit both biodiversity and agriculture, marketing them, finding finance. They need support to support their partners to make those things happen in a way that's very aligned across the landscape. So that's a first part of financing. The second part of financing is that the funds are flowing piece by piece within the landscapes in such a fragmented way, we will never get impacts at scale. So we need new financial mechanisms that will collect those flows of funds from climate and biodiversity and agriculture and food security and health and allow them to be pooled to support sets of landscape investments 
but in agriculture, in protected areas, in agro-industry, uh, in infrastructure, that natural infrastructure, uh, in a way that's coordinated and can deliver much, much larger volumes of funding to deliver the goals of the original funding agencies, but in a much more integrated way. And the third aspect of this is that the financial system itself is not set up now to either invest in these integrated agriculture biodiversity production practices or in the agro industry or in the marketing uh, or in the protected area management that also includes uh, use of, 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 of products. Um, the financial system itself needs to innovate and we need to work with them. Uh, otherwise more money will just mean things are done still in the same old ways. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I am very happy to see a question that Ms. Emma Scott is raising. And, uh, and, and, and the reason why I'm very happy to see that question is because uh, personally it's very close to my heart. Uh, we depend on a very small number of foodstuffs. Uh, this morning, there was a, one of the questions in the poll was that we have less than 40 animal species that over uh, a 15 or 17,000 species of uh, mammals and birds. So we depend on, 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 on very little of um, uh, species. The question that Ms. Scott uh, is, uh, is asking to any of the panelists is, how do we increase uh, the intake of our biodiversity, including what is called the forgotten varieties or the forgotten uh, crops? Uh, crops that in the past, coming from Mexico, we, are, uh, we pro provide to the world more than 80 crops for, um, for um, feeding. But some of them are very rich and almost forgotten. How can we do the uptake of these forgotten varieties? Anyone who, who wants to take a staff of this. Uh, Joao, uh, sorry for calling you Joao, but thank you. This is a, thank you, thank you very much. This is this is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart as well. Um, so let me take a uh, you know let me try to, to respond to this. So today, you know, we need to realize that seventy five percent of our human caloric intake comes from twelve plants and five animals. This is it. Um, and you can begin to imagine what this does to nature, right? I mean, this is a, almost a call to convert nature into monocrops. Um, and this happens because we needed to, to provide calories for, you know, grow a growing population so that they would come out of hunger. But today, I mean, the pressures on natural ecosystems that these monocrops uh, uh, face are threatening uh, soil health, they are threatening uh, the environmental services and they are threatening diets as well. I mean, we are consuming mostly cheap calories because the hidden costs of the food system, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, are not accounted for. And that's why we call them cheap calories. So we need to diversify production. We need to help companies uh, restructure their supply chains. I'll give you a, an example. I was talking to a food company the other day that sources two types of potatoes from Peru. I mean, imagine the number of types of and potato varieties everywhere in Latin America. And for a major food company to source two types is, is really shocking. And the question I asked was why? It's because they structured, the company structured its supply chain around those two types of potatoes, so its size, its suppliers, and all of that. So we need really to transform business models if we are going to have an uptake of agro, more agro-biodiverse foods. And the reason also why there is very little market demand for what we call the forgotten crops or the uh, orphan crops is because it becomes too costly to ship them um, everywhere in the global trade system. So they tend to be very relevant locally, uh, helping to establish very short supply chains that provides food variety for people. So uh, we do need to do a better job, including in the Food System Summit. We do have a cluster that looks into scaling out agrobiodiversity. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe, maybe we need to... Uh... 
uh, start forming a coalition to rescue these uh, these crops as a, as a response to what is coming into the uh, summit. Because I, I really believe there is a lot of uh, rich. That's just my personal bias. Being a moderator, I should not put my bias on the conversation. But thank you for. Uh, there, is, there are some other questions uh, for Dr. Garibaldi. Uh, Dr. Garibaldi, uh, they're asking us if you can comment on the current area-based targets in the post-2020 agenda uh, and the needs uh, uh, to also consider working in landscapes. Uh, thank you. Yes, this is something that has not been considered before because we paid a lot of attention to natural reserves outside working landscapes. We call working landscape to those landscapes that uh, perform agriculture, forestry, or animal breeding, which is most of our planet. But uh, uh, natural habitats uh, also play an important role within working landscape, and we need to protect them to protect ourselves. So as I mentioned, <clears throat> they are habitat for wild pollinators, <clears throat> but they also prevent uh, flooding, they regulate climate, they prevent uh, soil erosion. They have many, many benefits to the production system itself. And this is a key, a key new aspect that should be taken into account. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Lucas. Uh, in, in Mexico, we have discovered that also some bats are important pollinators. And uh, one of our biggest industries, tequila, depends on bats. So uh, if when we talk about conservation of pollinators, <laughs> We had to talk about conservation of other species that are unique to our region. So thank you for bringing that subject. Uh, I have uh, received um, a message that uh, Dr. Boyd wants to make comments probably on the forgotten varieties. Is that correct, Dr. Boyd? No, go ahead, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Somebody, Chair. If and somebody wants to make other comments, please just raise your hand and I look into them. Okay, I just wanted to say that I think and this goes back to our earlier conversation about implementation and and money you know this is this is the thing in terms of both production and consumption right now we have a system where the overwhelming amount of money that government provides in terms of subsidies is going to the production of the small handful of crops and and breeds that uh, Joao and you have mentioned we need to redirect some of that government subsidy to the production of these forgotten forgotten varieties and more importantly to we the vast majority of subsidies today goes to a handful of large producers. And if we shift those subsidies to small producers, then we will, will we be directly produ uh, encouraging the production of a more diverse set of food, foodstuffs. And the same thing can be said on the, on the consumer side, consumption wise, you know, when governments produce their national nutritional guidelines, that's an opportunity to promote these uh, forgotten species. When governments use their money to do procurement programs, whether that's through school meal programs, through food in hospitals, that's another opportunity to promote these local forgotten varieties. So I think that there are ways that we can use the both the push and the pull of production and consumption to boost agro, agro biodiversity in really powerful ways. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I, I have, we have two more questions that I would like to pose. Um, but before I pose the questions, and in order to provide transparency, we have in our chat and the questions and answers a comment made by Mr. Uh, Juan Pablo Partiera, and I'm going to read it just uh, for the records and said that I, Juan Pablo Partiera says, I will uh, disagree with Professor Hilbert on the most e effective way to protect marine biodiversity is by fisheries management. Uh, Mr. Pa Partiera uh, suggests that marine ecosystems are also suffering of other pressures for which area-based methods guarantee better protection in a specific hotspots, especially when the offshore energy is developing fast. Maritime transport is more intense and deep sea mining is also adding more pressure. I have to put this uh, in the conversation because uh, I think there are some topics and show the complexity of the oceans where uh, a lot of things are happening. There is a question for all the panelists. Uh, that, well, the, the next two questions are for all the, all the panelists. And the first question is, what kind of investments we need to address the issues that you just described? What is this investment that's going to come from? And how do we apply the investment in the countries? Uh, especially because uh, less developed countries or middle income countries 
are the ones who are in the eye of the storm. Uh, what is your um, your ideas uh, on on investment? Uh, who wants to start? Uh, Luis uh, Garibaldi, you raise your hand. Please go ahead, and then uh, <laughs> Dr. Sherrod, and then Dr. Boy, and then we go probably with Yao. But Luis, adelante. Yes. So. <clears throat> I work in agroecology for the past uh, more than 20 years. And <clears throat> in many cases, it's not a problem of its investment, it's a problem of lack of knowledge. Because some of these practices that promote pollinators and native habitats, they pay by their own. We are now suffering in many places in the world the loss of agricultural land because of land degradation because of floodings and we are facing a lot of problems also with, with resistance to herbicides. So um, the current conventional agricultural system in many places is not so profitable anymore. So, and when you talk with the farmers, they, are, they see these kind of problems and they want to change in many places, but it's not clear how to implement these new uh, agroecological or ecological intensification practices. So they, they, they don't know how to do it. And uh, we need also to emphasize this aspect of knowledge. So ecological practices are less intensive in the use of agrochemical and external inputs in general, but they are more intensive in the use of knowledge and in particular ecological knowledge. So we, we should pay attention also a lot to, to that too co-generate that knowledge with the farmers and to share and to create the structure so this can this knowledge can spread all over the world thank you thank you uh sarah i uh, think you uh, you were a uh, second please sure i actually think the financing piece is one of the most interesting and exciting parts of this puzzle um if we think about these all the landscape descriptions that have been, been already shared here, uh, we're talking about recreate, sort of shifting those systems of land use, the systems of markets, the systems of production within a landscape. And that means, the, and, and, they, and they're interconnected. If you want to reduce their risk, if you want to improve the profitability of the commercial activities, if you want to reduce the average cost so that each actor doesn't have to invest separately in things that are actually collective goods and services, uh, then you need financial systems that match those needs. And what we're starting to see is some pretty creative, innovative stuff going on by financial institutions partnering with groups who have real commitments to these kinds of, of, of issues, where you're looking at the complementarity of investments, enabling investments, asset investments working together to make those investments more viable. And if they're not yet fully commercial viable, other actors can come in with complementary grant and other kinds of resources by by working together. And there's some extremely interesting innovations out there. I won't you know, go into all the details, but just a couple of examples where uh, large landscape or multi-landscape funds are being put together in which flows of investment from public sector in different sectors, uh, climate funding, health funding can go into these funds and then redeployed for a lot of smaller projects within the landscape that create these synergies. Another is the idea of a landscape bank just like we have community development banks, have landscape development banks that are staffed by people with both financial expertise and an understanding of agriculture and, and, and environment within the landscape that can develop that portfolio and pull in financial resources that are at a large scale from lots of different sources and make them locally viable, locally productive and, and locally profitable for the commercial components of, of, of the work. So I'll stop there. Thank I you. think there's we're on the cusp of some pretty cool innovations and financial institutions around the world are actually becoming much more interested in this as a result of the obligations on them around climate and the new ones that are coming up around biodiversity. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, Dr. Boyd uh, uh, and uh, Joao, Joao, go ahead. And then Dr. Boyd. And I don't know if I'm missing someone. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to pick up uh, where Sarah left and, and, and hinge on, on her response. Investors pursue two things, right? They pursue, they, they maximize, the, investments pursue the maximization of return and the minimization of risk. 
And risk is a, there is a lot. There is a huge component of risk that has to do with information. So let's look at how much research, and this goes back to what Mr. Garibaldi was saying, how much research money goes into the traditional um, um, agriculture and traditional crops, if you will, and how much goes into researching the benefits and the returns of agroecology, for example. I mean, you know, no wonder why investors choose uh, uh, the status quo, because there's not much information out there. So I would argue that if we want to maximize alternative or more uh, sustainable approaches to food production, we need to invest heavily on research, you know, on the opportunities that we have, identify what are the benefits of investing in regenerative practices, in regenerative agriculture, in agroecology, and show the benefit of this. It's only by having information out there on solid research that we can scale out the, these practices and put them where they belong, which is at the front and center of the transformation that we aim to achieve. So let's invest on research um, and development on agroecology, regenerative practices, so that we can put them, you know, at the, the you know, make make them um, have uh, the protagonism they 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 do have already uh, on food system transformation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Boyd. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, I'd just like to start by saying, let's let's consider the scale of the investments required. We're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars every year. That's the cost, but the that's the investment required. But the potential benefits, as Joao mentioned earlier, are literally in the trillions of dollars in terms of uh, health and environmental benefits. So we're going to need some substantial sources of revenue here. And one pot that I've already mentioned is the subsidies. We know that uh, wealthy countries are already spending over $500 billion a year on agricultural subsidies uh, and, and fisheries subsidies to do things like subsidizing the fuel of industrial trawler fleets. I mean, that just simply is, doesn't make sense for us to do. So redirecting subsidies to sustainable practice, number one. Number two, shifting taxes. We need to use the polluter pays principle. That would be putting a tax on things like water pollution, carbon pollution, uh, and other things that could raise billions of dollars. Thirdly, we need international assistance to low income states. And I think that it's interesting to draw an analogy with climate change where in Paris in 2015, the wealthy nations committed to mobilizing at least $100 billion a year in climate finance for low and low income countries and small island developing states. There should be a similar commitment to biodiversity conservation from the high income states. And the fourth uh, source of revenue, I think we need to reevaluate our priorities as societies. The trillions of dollars that are being spent every year on the arms race, on, on military spending, that could be repurposed to, uh, and could and should be repurposed in pursuit of the sustainable development goals. You look at a country like Costa Rica and the success they've had since they eliminated, eliminated military spending in the 1940s. They, they have spent money on healthcare and education, as you know, as a, as a close neighbor of, of Costa Rica and Mexico. They have the highest literacy rates in the Americas. They have the longest life expectancy. They have a terrific environmental record. They're not perfect, but I think they're an illustration of what kind of radical changes can actually lead to more sustainable societies. Thank you. I wonder if uh, the secretary and Kat show on the screen the results of our poll before I pose the last question. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, we have to move for the next panel. These topics are so exciting that will probably keep us busy for the next 10 years or something. The results of the, uh, of the panel, uh, the poll questions is that 65% uh, of our respondents said that 20% of the uh, terrestrial planet is intact. Uh, the reality of uh, the question, the answer to the question, excuse me, is that 40 percent. Uh, of course, when it's 40 percent, we have to be considering the dry lands, the deserts, and the forests. So we still have an important piece of uh, earth that has been uh, remained intact. Uh, what percentage of emerging infectious human diseases originate in, in animals? Uh, everybody, I think, is, uh, it was correct. Uh, at least 70% of our diseases are uh, related of 
to, uh, to animal. And let me pose the last question. Uh, and I just gonna pose the last question to, um, uh, to move forward. I, I, I don't expect this to be answered by anyone. But the question is, with everything that we have heard today and we heard this morning, how do we move the agenda forward? How do we compromise between the needs of the low income countries, the middle income countries and the developed countries? Um, sometimes uh, the proposed solutions look very nice from the uh, developed countries uh, perspective by the low income countries do not have the resources to do it. The question is, how do we move this agenda forward and how do we uh, protect biodiversity and make a mother earth more um, uh, a better place for the future generations. Thank you to all the panelists for uh, your uh, uh, contributions. I, I came to FAO for the first time in two months since I arrived to Rome. Uh, let me tell you, after uh, listening to you, I'm going to get out more energetic to continue to uh, uh, advance the, uh, the transformation of agriculture uh, and our food systems for, um, uh, for a better future. Thank you so much. And I pass the moderation to my, to my colleague for the next, uh, for the next session. Uh, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Mignel. And uh, uh, I'm supposed to then begin with the next uh, panel uh, discussion, but I hear that the Fisher's question was not answered by Ray. Um, Ray, do you want to come in? Uh, yes, yeah. Well, so yeah, yes, thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much. I just wanted to My point apologies. out that, whoops, I just wanted to point out that uh, that the aquatic world seems to always be forgotten in the food world. Uh -huh. And the, uh, the, the diversity of food uh, that comes from the ocean, both from capture fisheries and aquaculture, is much more diverse than uh, and much less specialized around a few, a few species. Um, and I think, as you all know, uh, aquaculture is the fastest uh, growing form of, of food production. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't forget about it. And also, let's not forget that there's intimate connection between the two. So much of aquaculture depends upon uh, food grown on, on land. And if you look at where the environmental impacts of some forms of aquaculture are, they're actually not in the ocean or in the water, they're actually where the crops are grown. So uh, don't, don't forget about the oceans and the important of, importance of aquatic foods in the global food system. Uh, certainly, thank you very much. Uh, we, we appreciate uh, your comment and fundamentally, um, it is true that uh, uh, without the ocean and the aquatic environment, uh, there is no life on Earth. Uh, certainly, that's a, a, a good reminder. Uh, I would like to now uh, call on the next panel, uh, which will focus our attention to the restoration of biodiversity and ecosystems, uh, with a particular emphasis on uh, landscapes and seascapes that are used for production. Uh, firstly, we have, uh, our, we have four speakers that uh, will participate in the, during this panel session. And the first uh, speaker is Mr. Percy Sommers, who is a Senior Director of Science and Development for Conservation International uh, in Peru. He leads the Sustainable Landscapes um, a Partnership for Peru and grows native fruits using sustainable methods in foothills of the Chemileni National Park. You have the floor, Mr. Summers. Uh, five minutes, please. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Am I sharing? Yes, uh, we can see your screen. Oh, certainly, yes. you can proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Percy Summers from Conservation International, and I'm going to be 
talking about food production in the Amazon. I'm going to be focusing on the Peruvian Amazon and in systems with small landholders. And first of all, that have, has been historically well, ecosystems and for the livelihoods of human well beings. However, uh, increasing demand for food and land is putting a lot of pressure over these natural systems and the capacity of these systems to continue uh, contributing to uh, sustainable food production. Deforestation and forest degradation are major drivers of biodiversity loss. And um, in Peru uh, and in a lot of parts of the Amazon, smallholder systems, smallholder farming is responsible for a large proportion of deforestation. Uh, less than five hectares uh, opening in the forest are a, a major drive of deforestation in these areas. And so how do we address the increasing demand for food and resources while at the same time conserving the biodiversity and the ecosystem services necessary for this production to be sustainable? And so I'm gonna touch on a case study, which is in Alto Mayo. This case study showcases how we can increase um, the production and the uh, how investing in sustainable production systems can also uh, help reduce deforestation in, in, and increase the resilience of small farming systems. Alto Mayo is in the foothill of the Andes flowing into the Amazon uh, basin and it's a rich in biodiversity and endemic species. Um, however, as in many other places of the Andean Amazon, it's highly threatened, especially by migration, deforestation, and unsustainable agricultural practices. In this particular landscape, coffee is a main driver of deforestation. However, coffee can also be an opportunity. If we grow uh, coffee sustainably, we can and transition from sun agriculture to and monoculture systems to shade grown uh, and um, diversified system. We can actually uh, contribute to the same ecosystem services that, or to many of the ecosystem services that natural forest ecosystems provide. And our strategy has been for the last 10 years and we work under a landscape approach as Sarah mentioned before, a lot of what we do is conserve, but at the same time work with the drivers of deforestation to transform from conventional to sustainable uh, agricultural practices. And we, sign con we promote conservation agreements that are signed between uh, government officials and farmers where they commit to not deforest in exchange for a benefits and incentives to promote sustainable agricultural practices, including technical assistance, the equipment, and the uh, inputs that they need to not only promote more coffee in this case, but also produce much better quality coffee and get much higher prices, start to tap into export markets for specialty coffees that can pay those higher prices for the extra work that they're doing for conserving forest. But not only that, reducing pressure over forest has also allowed us to register this as carbon credits, commercialize and reinvest or use those, those, carbon, those um, benefits for carbon to invest in the farming systems itself. So now we have a system that, com that is completely uh, integrated, financing the farmers with the carbon credits for the extra work that they're doing and their commitments for conserving forest. Now we're currently using this approach and replicating this in the broader landscape, working also with indigenous people, using their knowledge of medicinal plants to, for example, tap into herbal teas that can access also as added value markets for their products. With cocoa, there's also opportunities since cocoa is a, a native as a variety and we're transitioning uh, cocoa farmer systems from high volumes to specialty crops that uh, chocolate uh, producers are searching for when they are uh, expanding their markets. So how do we scale this beyond a landscape approach? And this goes into the financing systems that has been mentioned before, 
we're promoting this Adela platform, which is a private public platform to invest in sustainable business models and not just uh, and taking this uh, to other biodiversity priority landscapes in the Peruvian Amazon. Uh, that's uh, what I wanted to uh, share with you today. And thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Summers. Uh, that was a, a pointed and clear thank you. I would like now to uh, call on our next speaker, Mr. Joseph Gavi. Uh, Joseph grew up in Niger, where as a young, at a young age, he became passionate about regreening violence through food bearing naturally drought, uh, natu naturally uh, using uh, drought resistant plants. He's an executive director of Sahara in uh, Sahel Foods in Niger and a social entrepreneur that supports regreening efforts in the Sahel. Mr. Gavi, you can take the floor and uh, you'll, he will talk to us about forest restoration and the Great Green Wall. Five minutes. Uh. And uh, as most of you, uh, thank you very much. As uh, the chair said, we're a social enterprise based in Niger Republic in the middle of the Sahel. Um, and as, as most of people uh, of you know, the Great Green Wall of the Sahara and the Sahel is a huge expanse of land. C'est une très grande uh, étendue de, de terre. Et cette étendue, uh, très souvent, uh, et ressemble à quelque chose comme ceci. Nous, nous voyons que nous aimerions que cette zone ressemble plutôt euh, à l'image suivante, qui d'ailleurs est la même terre que euh, la photo précédente, mais 15 ans plus tard. Alors, comment apporter ce changement à grande échelle? Surtout que nous voulons que ça se passe avec des espèces indigènes, surtout avec le, notre flore indigène du Sahel. Et ce qui a détruit no, notre flore indigène, nos arbres et nos, nos plantes vivaces, ça a été l'agriculture. Où les, euh, le défrichage des terres et la monoculture des céréales ont, ont, ont apporté une grande perte de biodiversité. Euh, alors, la réintroduction de la polyculture peut nous aider à ramener nos arbres et nos, nos plantes vivaces. Et cela peut déjà aider beaucoup la, les rendements de, de céréales. Vous voyez ici sur la photo à gauche des céréales qui ont été protégées par des plantes vivaces. Et à droite, dans le même champ, mais dans une zone où la protection des plantes vivaces n'était plus défait, vous pouvez voir que l'impact est très direct à travers la réduction de vent, la fertilité du sol, etc. Mais cela amène généralement à la réintroduction d'arbres d'une faible biodiversité. On se focalise sur deux ou trois espèces qui renforcent la fertilité des sols et on néglige le reste du potentiel naturel. Alors, nous voyons qu'au Sahel, nous disposons de douzaines de différentes euh, espèces ligneuses alimentaires qui donnent des fruits, qui donnent des graines, qui donnent des, des feuilles comestibles, qui donnent de la gomme et qui sont euh, des très bonnes sources de nourriture et qui donnent des, des aliments vraiment délicieux qui ont été consommés, exploités par nos mamans, nos grands-mères depuis la nuit des temps. On en trouve par exemple le datier du désert ou le balanité sejuxiaca, qui donne une très bonne huile alimentaire de haute qualité. Nous y trouvons le bosca sinegalensis ou le hanza, qui est pratiquement le soja du Sahel. Nous y trouvons le sclerocaria biria ou le maroula, un fruit très riche en vitamine C. Nous y, trouvons, euh, nous y découvrons qu'avec juste une, une petite association de différents euh, fruits d'arbres naturels et feuilles d'arbres naturels, nous pouvons couvrir la majorité des besoins nutritifs de l'organisme humain. Et nous découvrons que ce sont des fruits et des feuilles qui sont euh, très souvent faciles à stocker pour faire des réserves pour pouvoir nous protéger contre des années de difficultés. Ce qui est intéressant aussi, c'est que les, euh, la productivité de ces arbres est souvent plus élevée que celle des céréales, de la, des céréales classiques et pluviales. À gauche sur cette photo, vous voyez un arbuste de Hansa dont la production en graines séchées par année fait plus que le double que la moyenne céréalière de la République du Niger. 
Et ceci peut favoriser un modèle vraiment d'exploitation en, en mode de biodiversité. Parce que chacun de ces arbres, chacun de ces plantes ligneuses a une saison de, euh, de récolte un peu différente de l'autre. Et quand ils sont mis ensemble, ils arrivent à couvrir tous les mois de, de l'année et créer de l'activité à tout moment de l'année pour la population rurale. Pour réaliser ce, euh, ce potentiel et faire euh, exploiter ces plantes à grande échelle, nous fabriquons dans notre euh, industrie euh, sociale, nous transformons des produits de, alimentaires de qualité à partir des fruits et des feuilles de ces arbres. Nous les faisons en faisant à la fois des produits traditionnels et des produits entièrement innovants. Par exemple, en bas à gauche ici, vous voyez de euh, lait végétal de datier du désert. En haut à gauche, vous voyez du popcorn du Hansa. Ce sont des produits parfaitement innovants. Tandis qu'en haut à droite, vous retrouverez du sel végétal extrait de la feuille de baboule, qui est un produit très traditionnel, exploité depuis des millénaires dans le Sahel. Ces arbres donnent bien sûr plus que des aliments. Ils donnent aussi des produits cosmétiques, des produits artisanaux et bien d'autres choses qui eux aussi sont des valeurs importantes pour la population rurale. Ce qui est très important pour nous, c'est aussi de savoir intégrer les produits de ces arbres dans des euh, euh, marchés haut de gamme, parce que par le passé, ils ont souvent été stigmatisés, vus d'un œil euh, dérogatoire comme étant des, des produits pour des personnes euh, vivant en situation de misère. Et en pouvant les intégrer dans des marques de luxe et dans des endroits de, de luxe, on aide à rétablir leur réputation comme étant des produits de haute qualité, bonnes pour tout le monde à consommer. Et cela nous permet de créer des chaînes de valeur qui sont très inclusives pour la population rurale, surtout pour les femmes du milieu rural, souvent dans des villages reculés où il n'existe presque pas d'autres opportunités pour... pour Mr. Ces femmes aussi euh, s'engagent dans le reboisement, elles sèment des arbres. Des partenaires comme Action contre la désertification scarifient des terres pour permettre une meilleure euh, euh, pénétration de l'eau. Et nous pouvons voir que des terres qui ont autre, autrefois été dégradées sont en train d'être remplies par des petits arbres qui sont en train de régénérer l'environnement. Et cette connaissance s'est passée par les, les femmes cueilleuses, à leurs enfants et à leurs petits-enfants comme ici cette femme qui a, avec son petit-fils qui a semé un arbre quand il était tout petit. Je vous remercie beaucoup. Merci, merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you, thank you once again, Mr. Kavi. And I would like uh, now to invite Ms. Catherine Lovelock, who is a professor at the University of Queensland in Australia. Uh, Ms. Lovelock's uh, intervention will focus on coastal and mangrove restoration. Good evening, Ms. Lovelock. Uh, thank you very much for joining us at this late hour in Australia. You have five minutes uh, to take the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Tonight I'm coming from uh, the, Kondamuk, the, the land of the Kondamuka people, and so I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Uh, this year we entered the UN decade of restoration. And so my intervention is to recommend that conservation and restoration of coastal ecosystems, which include mangroves, salt marshes and seagrass, are beneficial for the productivity of the landscape and also for securing Uh, the livelihoods and lives of coastal communities. So I'm going to share my screen. So one of the reasons why we want to restore coastal wetlands is because around 30 to 50% of them have been removed globally, and they've been largely removed for agriculture and aquaculture. For example, they've been removed in Myanmar for the production of rice. Uh, they've been removed in Australia for sugarcane production, shown by the image here on the left, and also throughout Southeast Asia to support aquaculture, particularly shrimp aquaculture. So these uh, pressures um, mean that we have reduced the ecosystem services that these uh, 
ecosystems provide, which include the support of biodiversity, fisheries, the provision of fibre, and also coastal protection and carbon sequestration. With climate change, sea level rise and extreme events are contributing to the salinization and flooding of coastal agricultural lands, reducing yields and incomes of coastal people. So coastal wetlands, mangroves, seagrasses and salt marshes, if we can restore them, can protect the land from these extreme events by providing physical protection from storms and uh, other uh, extreme events, for example, tsunamis, and also by limiting Ms. flooding. Sorry, Ms. Lovelock. Uh, sorry, sorry, Catherine. Can you please just uh, hold on a bit? I understand there is a problem with translation uh, uh -huh. so that Secretariat can fix that and then we will allow you to continue. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Can can Secretariat confirm is the translation back? I have no response. Uh, hello, Monica, or who, who else is online? Can you please confirm if translation is back? Yes. Well, Thank just, you. Just one minute, I will confirm. Okay, all right. Okay, all right. Uh, it looks like uh, we're back, uh, Miss uh, Lovelock. We can continue the Spanish uh, interpretation works. And if there is uh, any further hassle, uh, please uh, let's uh, just raise your hand. Uh, we will then notice. Uh, for now, we allow you to continue and uh, maybe raise your voice a little bit uh, so that the interpreters maybe uh, do not have to struggle. Thank you. Okay. So um, I think where we were up to was that uh, coastal wetlands can protect coastal land by attenuating waves and also by attenuating uh, tidal flows. So they can actually provide a range of coastal protection for coastal agri agriculture. They also, as I said before, support a wide range of biodiversity. They're fisheries nurseries, and they also support biodiversity of terrestrial animals that frequently use uh, mangroves uh, for foraging and uh, for uh, uh, additional habitat. Finally, they contribute to carbon sequestration removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. They are very powerful carbon sinks, which has been called blue carbon. So um, these are all of the reasons why we should uh, uh, support the restoration of coastal wetlands because of their uh, value uh, to coastal uh, communities and that they can actually support the agriculture uh, and aquaculture in those landscapes. So how do we increase incentives for coastal wetland restoration? And blue carbon uh, could provide the incentives that, in, that are required. So blue carbon are, are words that are used to describe the carbon that's sequestered, that is held within the biomass and also the soils of coastal wetlands. So these, the carbon levels are very high because these ecosystems are flooded and soils have very low oxygen. So the, the productivity of the ecosystems is held within those soils 
for very long periods of time. So blue carbon projects, if they are monetized in some way or they're used to generate uh, carbon credits for their that, that can be generated through restoration, could be sold or swapped or in some other mechanism used to provide income streams as well as providing fuel, fibre and uh, support for uh, biodiversity. So um, in my short presentation, I've hoped to uh, convince you that the restoration of these coastal ecosystems can contribute to achieving climate change mitigation because of their uh, impacts on removing CO2 from the atmosphere. They provide adaptation because they are increasing coastal protection for coastal communities, and they can also help us achieve our biodiversity goal. And uh, with that, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm finished with my presentation. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, thank you very much uh, uh, once again uh, for uh, taking the time in the evening, Ms. Lovelock, and uh, the message is clear and I hope that you'll be able to stay on uh, uh, when it's time for questions, uh, in case there are people interested in uh, aspects of your presentation in respect of uh, uh, coastal and mangrove uh, restoration and what the benefits are uh, if we uh, continue to protect those ecosystems. Thank you very much. Um, if I may, um, just to remind you as participants, there is a, a section where you have on your screen where you either have a chat box, uh, you would have a section there for language interpretation, and then you select that language interpretation and choose the language uh, of your choice. And we have uh, interpretation in six languages. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like now to move on and um, invite uh, the next speaker. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Gustav Barioni, uh, who is an agronomist and an animal scientist from Embrapa uh, uh, in, in Brazil. He will speak for five minutes on pasture restoration and sustainable grazing practices. Uh, Mr. Barioni, you have the floor. Five minutes, please say. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, well, uh, I would like to um, start by saying and remind you that pasture degradation is a process and it's a process of loss of productivity and the loss of soil health. And uh, this starts usually by uh, losing nutrients that are not replaced in the grassland. And then it uh, makes uh, the grassland to lose carbon and soil organic matter which then leads to uh, lower soil water holding capacity. And as the farmer uh, does not notice the decreasing productivity of the grassland, then it leads to overgrazing and then to more drastic loss of uh, soil capacity of uh, production and, uh, and, and, and the health in general. And uh, when it gets into the loss of soil cover and more erosion, loss of infiltration, the restoration costs of those areas become very high, either for agriculture uh, or restoration of, um, of uh, 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 forests. We now have a uh, technology uh, for uh, reduced sensing uh, determination of levels of degradation on pastures. And this, while well, this website uh, shows online the levels of degradation of pasture land in Brazil. So we, we can target uh, now like public, public policies for restore pasture uh, of uh, uh, target regions. Um, also, 
there is here a constraint for restoration that is okay you need uh, large investments that can be provided sometimes by the government but still need to have demand for uh, grassland products uh, to uh, maintain the pasture uh, productivity levels high. Um, so next, I, 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 I want to remind you uh, also uh, that uh, soil, uh, soils can uh, uh, be a, a great thing, a sink of carbon. And uh, we probably um, underestimate uh, the, the potential for carbon sequestration in tropical oxidic soils and deep-rooted grasses, uh, because most of uh, the inventories and model estimations, uh, they uh, are used for up to 20 to 30 centimeters uh, soil depth. Uh, while half of the carbon stock changes happen uh, below 30 centimeters uh, in this case of uh, pasture restoration. There is also a, a lack of knowledge about uh, non-symbiotic nitrogen fixation in those grasslands. We know that there is a, quite a bit of nitrogen fixation in non-symbiotic uh, um, microorganisms, but uh, we do not know uh, how to model that uh, fixation and relate that to soil degradation. Um, pasture land is not increasing in the world anymore. And uh, that seems to be good because we can uh, now uh, have like a, 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 a no deforestation or reduce deforestation. Um, uh, but we, we need to, with this area, to provide uh, living for 1.7 billion people that depends on those areas. And, and now economic activities for those people depends on also design of uh, public policies. If they are going uh, still to be on farming and uh, uh, growing crops or growing bioenergy or we are doing a reforestation and then relocate those people to urban areas by migration. So if uh, it's uh, people are to stay there and uh, there is a uh, competition for land as it's increasing, we need uh, to provide a, a higher productivity of land on pastures and this like pasture restoration is a, a, a very um, important part of this solution. So that's what I uh, would like to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Parioni, uh, for that uh, illuminating uh, outline of uh, a pasture pasture land uh, that is not increasing and uh, the pressures that are associated with that and and certainly uh, it's a food for thought in terms of what are the best uh, solutions and practices that uh, uh, we look uh, to adopt uh, into the future. Uh, now before I call on the last uh, uh, speaker I just would like to uh, remind uh, participants that uh, the, the, the questions are open uh, so you can start writing your and submitting your short questions uh, in order for us uh, to then begin to make those questions uh, uh, put across uh, to the presenters and, uh, and, and then you have the conversation in terms of responses. Um, just uh, to confirm, Ms. Lovelock, you will stay on. Uh, we already have questions uh, in respect of the coastal areas or the coastal habitat. Um, and maybe you can start thinking about the first question, uh, uh, which is how do coastal habitats compare to terrestri terrestrial forests in terms of carbon sequestration per unit area? 
Um, I would uh, like to uh, request that uh, we take a final keynote speech from uh, Mr. Schengen Fan, who is a Dean of Global Food Economics and a Policy and Chair a Professor at China Agricultural University. He is also a member of the Global Panel on Agriculture and Food Systems for Nutrition and the Council of Advisors of the World Food Prize. In 2014, Mr. Fan received Hanga Zero Award, Hanga Hero Award from the World Food Program in recognition for his commitment and leadership in fighting hunger. And the common thread in terms of what uh, he's going to address is the issue of valuing biodiversity and the economic costs of biodiversity loss and degradation. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the presentation that we'll get. And uh, Mr. Fan, uh, you have the floor and uh, for a, a period of 10 minutes. Uh, so you can take the floor and uh, soon after you've spoken, I would hand over to my co-chair uh, to facilitate the responses to the questions. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Chair, or thank you, Co-Chair. This is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for me to give you some of the thoughts on the policy and economics related issues uh, of biodiversity. I do think the economists uh, had not paid enough attention to this issue but they begin to wake up and I uh, want them. So for the last five to 10 years, I begin to zoom in to look at the economics and the policy issues of biodiversity. So what I'm going to do is to uh, look at three issues. One is whether biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation, so how serious they are. The second is valuing the biodiversity. So can we put a cost, can we put a benefit of preserving biodiversity? And finally, so what are the policies, what are the strategies that we can transform our food system to make sure that our biodiversity uh, is, is kept, kept, is protected? So we know that the, you know, the biodiversity and the ecosystem have declined uh, for, for the last several decades, and it, it has accelerated uh, for the probably uh, since the, uh, let's say, industrialization. So major reasons include obviously climate change, pollution, uh, the direct exploitation of organisms, change in land and sea, uh, sea use, and invasion, invasion of non-native species. By the way, I'm a member of the Gustav, uh, um, Sir Gustav's uh, review of the, um, the ag agro biodiversity um, initiative. So clearly, you know, we are losing the biodiversity quite a bit. So around a 1 million animal and plant species are now threatened with extinction. extinction. So I think um, many probably within, within decades. And the current rate of extinct, extinction is tens to hundreds of times higher than the average over the past 10 million years. So that loss uh, is really accelerating because of human activities. And the biodiversity loss is one of the top five risks perceived by a WEF, World Economic Forum CEOs. So it's a serious issue. Now, the, okay, the biodiversity loss has huge economic cost that we have not paid enough attention before. So for example, uh, it is estimated that the worth of biodiversity is at $33 trillion per year. So it's a bigger than combined US and China's GDP. Could you imagine you know, the, the worth of the biodiversity, value of biodiversity is huge. And land, land degradation costs more than 10% of the annual global GDP in lost ecosystem services. You can see the cost uh, is high. And between 1992 and 2014, you know, which we have the data, so produced capital per person doubled, and a human capital per person increased by about 13% globally. But the stock of natural capital per person declined by nearly 40%. So, you, so we have seen the increase human capital, physical capital, but a rapidly decline of the nature capital. So 
the six sources of biodiversity value. So how do we are going to value the, the biodiversity? It came from six sources. Um, human existence, contribution to health, amenity, intrinsic value, use value, existence value, and so on. So, um, so the agrobiodiversity is a foundation of the food system. So here we, you know, right now we are in a process of uh, preparing the Global Food System Summit. I think agrobiodiversity must be part of that dialogue. It is a foundation of our food system. And the biodiversity is essential to ensure the provision of ecosystem services and to maintain a very high uh, and a stable agricultural production. Now, some of the uh, figures, some of the data from CGIR, you will see that uh, uh, there is a strong relationship be between standardized pest control and a standardized natural enemy richness and a standardized with the pollination and a standardized you know, pollinators richness. So that shows the biodiversity benefits the crop production. And the agricultural fields with greater bi biodiversity are better protected from harmful insects, promote uh, pollination, and produce high yields. And the strong evidence has shown that. And up to 50% of negative effects of landscape uh, simplification on ecosystem services was due to the richness losses of service providing organisms uh, with negative consequences for crop yields. And maintaining the, the biodiversity of ecosystem services providers is vital to sustain the flow of key agrosystem benefits to the society. And holding and reserving current trends of land degradation uh, could generate up to 1.4 trillion, trillion US dollars per year of economic benefits. Now the biodiversity for food and the nutrition, you know, CGIR, particularly Biodiversity International, uh, together with SEAD now, are, are working very hard to make sure that we protect our biodiversity, to make sure that our food system, future food system, uh, will continue to be productive, will continue to produce healthy, nutritious, and diverse foods for everybody. So now the problem, yes, do exist. So, we see the persistence of malnutrition and poverty. Yeah. Uh, we see the homogeneous diets, you know, lots of uh, calories and lots of meat, uh, and lots of uh, uh, stable crops, but not enough fruits, vegetables, or high quality proteins, uh, limited access to foods, uh, poorly developed markets. So all these have contributed to persistence of malnutrition uh, and poverty. Now, how are we going to transit to a sustainable path so I came back to China after serving, after working for CGIR for almost 30 years, and as a director general of International Food Policy Research Institute for 10 years. So, so right after I came back, I worked with some of my uh, colleagues, the Chinese colleagues and EPRI colleagues, CGIR colleagues, to look at how can we rebuild or transform the food system after the COVID-19. So through the data uh, connection, through the modeling, through the analysis, and we propose seven strategic transitions for our food systems to be sustainable, to produce healthy new churches, um, foods, and to protect our biodiversity to make sure that in the future, we continue to have access to, uh, let's say to this uh, diversity. So number one transition is technological innovations. But today the, the innovations should not be just one wing. That's one wing on yield, but we also, must win on nutrition, must win on protecting our biodiversity and our environment. So multiple wind technologies, uh, there are lots of them you know, in Brazil, in China, in India, even in Africa. And the number two is to repurpose subsidies. You know, the latest OECD reports tells us that right now, the countries are subsidizing, are using $700 billion to subsidize our food production water subsidy, input subsidy like fertilizers, machinery subsidies, pesticide subsidies, subsidy and so on. So these subsidies do not produce healthy nutritious foods and they are not sustainable, definitely not climate resilient. They are not very economic efficient. 
So how can we repurpose the subsidies, keep the money in food and agriculture sector, and to use that money to promote more nutritious, healthy food production, or developing value chains, or protecting natural resources, protecting biodiversity, to make sure that uh, our future food production will be sustainable. So number three is to invest in new infrastructure. So it's not just uh, the traditional infrastructure like the roads, telecommunications, irrigation. New infrastructure means digital uh, infrastructure, you know, broadband, access to internet, and so on. And the protection of biodiversity is a gene bank in many, in many countries, so new infrastructure. And then number three is inst institutional innovations. If you wanted to bring every, everybody to work for our food system, then we need to change our governance. That's at a national level. Do we have a coordination mechanism to bring different actors from agriculture, environment, health, uh, and even finance to promote the, the food system transformation the way we like to have? And the number five is to respect nature. So we learned a huge lesson, huge lesson in the past. So the distance between humans and the nature have become very close. So lots of diseases, zoonotic disease, diseases can jump to human and jump to humans very easily. So we have seen the it's an exponential increase in zoonotic diseases for the last several decades. So how can we design certain policy to protect our nature, to keep some distance between human and the nature is very critical. And the wider life, biodiversity will have to be protected. And number six is open and resilient trade. We know that trade is still very critical. Trade is very critical to make sure that our food production is efficient and our resources are used more efficiently because different parts of the world have different efficiency of converting natural resources to food. Uh, even the climate, uh, a greenhouse gas emission, so we can optimize trade. But trade must be resilient. Must, trade must make sure that uh, the farmers, the poor consumers are protected and nature is protected. And can we make sure that next WTO negotiation taking into consideration of, net, of natural resource management and nutrition and health? And Dr. finally, mm -hmm. to change our behavior. So we must Dr. know that Dr. what Hunt, we need to uh, for our uh, health, but also to uh, our environment. So let's change our behavior by ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 Dr. Fan, it's a pleasure seeing you. Uh, last time we saw each other was in Washington, but um, nice to see you and thank you for your conversation. Now, this is Miguel Garcia from Mexico again, and I have uh, the pleasure to conduct the next uh, uh, 30, 40 minutes of this session um, that has produced uh, very interesting uh, comments and has uh, generated a lot of interest for what I, we can see in the question and answer and in the chat um, log, we see a lot, a lot of very interesting conversations. Before um, we go into the general discussion, I would like to add the secretariat, if they can share with us the next uh, poll um, that we would like to, for you to, uh, to consider. Uh, again, this, um, these questions are uh, questions that uh, we hope can be used to sensitize the importance of the topic and to make it um, uh, and, and to make us more aware of the of the challenges and needs that we have. Uh, one of the we all agree that bees and pollinators in general, the bees are not the only ones uh, who pollinate. Um, crops, but pollinators in general are an essential component on the food systems. Uh, however, um, we just want to know what is your opinion on how much of global crop production volume comes from pollinators dependent crops. Um, it will be interesting to know your, um, your answer. Then the second question is probably a little bit more complex and it was already pointing us into a very complex issue that was already brought by the previous panel when they were asking about investments. Uh, the investments um, cannot be separated for, from the issue of subsidies. 
But many countries uh, give direct subsidies to agriculture, fisheries, water use, and to uh, the production of inputs such as energy and fertilizers, which amount between four to six uh, trillion US dollars globally per year. How much is this in relation to biodiversity conservation and restoration? Uh, I think this is a very, very, very interesting question, which we can tie to some of the previous comments that we had on, on the issues of uh, uh, investments in science and technology. Uh, one of our previous uh, speakers suggested that we should invest in science and technology and research for uh, eco um, agriculture or new sustainable practices. But uh, uh, he was probably very much aware that the amount of research is, uh, and the, the amount of funding that goes into public research for agriculture today is at a very, very low level. So let's put this on the discussions. Hopefully we can get your comments as soon as possible. And uh, in the meantime, I would like to go into the questions and to promote a conversation for at least the next 30, 35, 40 minutes. Let, let, let me start with a question that was posed by one of our youngest participants in the previous session. And the question that, and, and this is to everyone who wants to respond it. Uh, she, uh, she is one of our young, younger participants in this forum. And uh, she wants to consider if, uh, what is your opinion of relocalization of the food production as a possible way to tackle biodiversity loss and environmental damage if done sustainable. Uh, that is to be probably looking into more uh, local markets, uh, regional integration. What is your opinion of, uh, of you? I know you did not address this issue uh, precisely, but since you are experts and you have more experience than many of us, uh, what, is your, what is your opinion on this? Anyone who wants to take a, you, you can use the chat uh, uh, to raise your hand, if not, you just jump into, into the conversation. Maybe we can ask uh, Dr. Fan if he wants to, to address this issue. What is, what is the role, Dr. Fan, that you see for relocalizing markets and, and be looking into more localized markets uh, and food systems, call it food systems, as a way to protect biodiversity. What is your opinion? Yeah, I think it, it's a balance between efficiency and the resilience. Efficiency means that we needed to use a global market uh, to, to access to our foods uh, cheaply so we can have a more nutritious, healthy diet and, afford, and affordable diets. On the other hand, I think the COVID-19 taught us lesson that uh, if the, the supply chain, global chain, uh, chain is very long, then it's very vulnerable, very vulnerable to, uh, to shocks, health shocks. And also could also, could also contribute to the, the loss of biodiversity. So it's a balance. So I, I think the, we need to rethink about the local food production systems. You know, it's a system, I use S here. It's just not one or two, many community food systems where they can use their natural resources around themselves uh, to promote regenerative or circular uh, food production and to eat seasonal foods, so not necessarily you know, all year round, I have to eat everything. Uh, I, I do think we need to change that. Now, obviously, I do think the trade is still very critical. So for example, here, uh, you know, I'm here in China, I don't have access to any tropical fruits. The trader will be able to help me. And here, just sitting here, I don't have that's a certain uh, seafood from deep sea. And then uh, obviously the trade will be able to help me to access to that. So I think we need to rethink about the roles of trade as well as local food production and using the different indicators, efficiency, nutrition and health and the protection of natural resources, including biodiversity as an indicator to evaluate this food system. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you, uh, um, thank you, Shannon. Uh, Dr. Lovelock, uh, my colleague, um, 
had uh, already presented to you one question that came and uh, we just want to thank you that you have remained with us. I just really uh, happy to, uh, uh, to have you. I know down on there is a little bit late, but uh, thank you for staying with us. The, the question is, is, is a very, it's a very interesting question because uh, I think people do not realize how important coastal uh, habitats are and what the role of these coastal habitats, um, uh, that these coastal habitats have in terms of carbon sequestration. Uh, the question is, how do you compare, although we may be comparing ap apples and oranges because they are different in ecosystems and they have different roles, but how do you compare these uh, uh, coastal ecosystems vis-a-vis uh, -vis terrestrial forests in carbon sequestration uh, per unit of area, if that's a possible okay. comparison? Oh, um, it is, it is. Um, you know, the, the, the data would say that the uh, mangroves and seagrasses and salt marshes have about somewhere between two and five times um, the, the per unit, you know, per hectare carbon sequestration. And that's largely because of the carbon sequestration within soils, mm -hmm. right, which is um, greater in uh, the coastal ecosystems than it usually is in terrestrial systems. It could be much higher than five, depending on which ecosystem you're comparing, right? So some of the large, you know, mangrove forests of Indonesia have got, you know, very high carbon sequestration, say, compared to, you know, a, a forest in the arid zone, for example. So it really depends on what you're going to compare. But it's higher. Somewhere between two and five is a good uh, round figure. Okay. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, but can I add one more thing, though, is that everybody Please. has to remember that, the, that coastal ecosystems have a much smaller global extent than terrestrial forests. So they tend to be more important locally and in countries that have a lot of coastal ecosystem resources or had a lot. Right. So, you know, it, I, I think different countries have uh, different opportunities in the blue carbon space. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think it, it also points out that we still in, in many parts of the world need to increase our knowledge of these coastal areas. I think these coastal areas have been kind of forgotten by many people. Uh, for many years, and I think uh, we are coming to realize the importance as a buffer for all for all sorts of uh, climatic events and, uh, and, and storms. Uh, Dr. Barioni, there are uh, quite a bit of uh, questions. There are about two or three questions related to the to your topic, and uh, let me see if I can put them together. I think uh, I think Brazil, together with Colombia and some other regions in in Mesoamerica have uh, developed a huge amount of knowledge on, on uh, silvopastoral systems. Uh, and, and I think uh, that those systems will probably uh, become uh, useful for, uh, and, and the knowledge that you have developed has, will become very useful for the future of livestock production around the world. Uh, the question is, uh, how can ecological sound management of, uh, of these systems, particularly the grazing system, can uh, be best incentivized via public policies? Uh, and how do you uh, help the market the structure, the, the market, how can the, the markets help uh, to develop interventions uh, for sustainable management of civil pastoral systems? Uh, what is what is your opinion? Uh, you know, you after 30 years of work in Brazil, uh, in these areas, it's, it's amazing what you and Colombia have been able to to achieve. Okay, I think um, the both public and market um, kind of a, a actions towards this kind of systems. Um, one is uh, now related to low carbon or, or, or zero um, or carbon neutral uh, beef, for instance, or, or, or milk. And you have like a, several companies doing that at the moment. 
I, I think they will have to look at not only to carbon, but also to water footprint and to biodiversity as well. Uh, but, well, it's a, it's a start. So they are incentivizing like integrated systems like crop livestock systems or silver pasture systems. Um, uh, that's the, the market part of that. Uh, there's also for the government uh, and the NDCs, the, the, the nationally um, determined contributions for carbon um, and for, 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 for reducing emissions. Um, and um, those are also included. And one, one of the, the main bottlenecks for that is the investment to start that kind of business, like uh, to, to uh, recover pastures, uh, planting trees, uh, developing machinery, to um, uh, having crops uh, uh, together with pasture, and a lot of uh, knowledge that's needed too. So, um, I think those are great bottlenecks, and I think uh, market and governments working together, they can um, uh, a, 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 a help to, 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 to make it possible that, that's feasible. Thank you. Uh, doc, Dr. Garvey, I, I think your presentation is, is, is a very eye-opening presentation. In, in the previous uh, session this afternoon, one of the questions that was brought was the forgotten crops. And uh, you came and presented us with a very exciting future of these uh, forgotten crops. Uh, uh, in, in your opinion, what we should do to to bring these uh, forgotten, what we call forgotten crops, and for the sake of a better word, uh, into mainstreaming. Uh, consuming this, this food will require a change in our, in our social norms, in our traditions. It will require to bring the industry to accept that some of these products are in reality very important products for nutrition. Uh, how do you see the future of these crops uh, and, and, and the future of your work? And what do you need to make it more, more uh, meaningful? Uh, well, thank you very much. I, I think that uh, these crops actually have a very bright future. Um, I think that um, what we need the most is to encourage the, the pioneers and the, the ones who are uh, doing the, the groundwork in getting these crops known because it's, they all have a kind of snowball effect. First, they're not known by anybody, they're not wanted by anybody. And the first uh, uh, centimeters moving them forward are the toughest. And once you start to kind of break the, uh, uh, the, the ice a little bit, everything starts moving better by itself. So I think that the first thing is to encourage and to support those who are working on new crops and trying to, uh, to make them better known and put them to better use. And second of all, I think we need a lot of um, support in terms of um, scientific research, because in today's world, we have very high expectations on a food. It should have been tested, it should have been analyzed, it should have been uh, this and that, and we want certificates for, for uh, seven different things. And all of these things um, can be very overwhelming to produce for a new food. So if there are uh, research institutions that get involved, that help, that are able to finance and do some of those studies, it will help going a long way in creating the acceptance in the, in the more formal markets for these types of foods. And I think the last thing that we need to do is we need to be uh, to keep being creative when it comes to marketing. We need to to be able to show that uh, these are foods that have a history. These are foods that, that have a, a connection to us as human beings. Uh, put that forward. Put that uh, forward in a creative and a fun way, and um, uh, remind people of the pleasure of uh, diversity. Uh, not just the beauty of seeing diversity, but the diversity of tastes we can experience, the, the diversity of ways we can eat, and, and keep on encouraging that in, in uh, the way we market and show these foods to the world. 
Let, let me, if you allow me, um, and, and the audience allow me, let, let me bring a, a, a part of the puzzle. Um, and maybe Dr. Somers can correct me. A few years back, quinoa was an unknown product. Quinoa was, uh, was consumed by the natives of the Andeans. It's a, it's a product of tremendous value, nutritional value. Uh, and the people who produce quinoa and someone went into the marketing of quinoa and quinoa became so popular and so, uh, so success, successful that uh, commanded very high prices. And then what we discovered, at least that's what some of my friends in Latin America told me, is that the indigenous people who consume quinoa could not afford quinoa and could not find quinoa because it was going to the market. Let me ask you a question. Is, how do we solve this problem of somebody discovering these beautiful products that are, and then suddenly the people in, that normally consume cannot afford them? What should, how do we find the balance between them? Now, th that is a very relevant question. And, and uh, the parallel between, for example, what we do in Niger at Sarah Salt Foods and the quinoa story uh, are manifold. So it's a very good uh, example that you brought up. Uh, what we try to do is we try to tell the rural population, we don't want you to produce to sell. We want you to produce for yourselves, your own needs, consume, and then bring us the surplus that you have. Um, so we try to work on also uh, developing their food culture and making them uh, enjoy and integrate these foods more into their own food habits. But it will, of course, remain a, a delicate question what you put forward. And I believe also that national policies will be important in keeping the balance between creating markets for the rural people and avoiding that the pro product becomes so exclusive that the ones who are supposed to eat it and enjoy it the most no longer have access to it. Mm -hmm. Well, but one of the beauties of these type of meetings is that we bring South to South and triangular cooperation. And I think you probably can have some conversation with our friends in the, in the Andeans who did this work. And, and they probably, you can probably enrich both uh, regions with these experiences. And talking about the Andeans, uh, obviously uh, the Andeans is a, is a very rich ecological region on many aspects, on many aspects. but. As uh, Dr. Sommer said, coffee is, uh, is, an area, is, is, is a crop of challenges and opportunities. Uh, I wonder if uh, you, Mr. Sommers, can tell us a little bit of what are the challenges that you have uh, found and how you have confronted and solved it to uh, integrate the value change of these particular uh, high-end products. Uh, uh, I know coffee, coffee is, uh, is a commodity that uh, that has a lot of producers and a lot of producers are looking for better prices, but being commoditized in, in, in certain parts of the world had made difficult for uh, these small farmers to really integrate themselves into the value chains and get a higher percentage of the benefits. What, what can you tell us? What, what are the challenges of integrating these value chains for um, high end commodity products like coffee, Dr. Somers. Yes, thanks. Um, and I'll try to link it to, to the previous conversation about balancing for local needs and for export markets. Of course, coffee is an export market and it's a, it's a value chain that's, that's already well-defined and it's a commodity. And uh, our interest in coffee was because it was a big driver of deforestation and, and we knew that that, that techniques for, for transitioning to a sustainable coffee model was not, um, was there, but the incentives for farmers to do that transition, the market was not playing in that favor. No, it was, it was favoring sun-grown high volumes. Uh, so we had, to, we had to, to experiment with a lot of different uh, strategies and tools. And the nice thing about the sustainable landscape model is that it allows you to not see in silos, but see the complete picture, right? 
So what we try to do was, okay, there's different markets, there's different niches, but there's also different opportunities for farmers to reach different kinds of markets. So we aimed for uh, bringing the demand side no? and start asking the demand side, what was what they were looking for and what was the, what they could pay higher prices for no? and try to bring that um, knowledge to the farmer. No? We need to produce this kind of coffee if we want to reach this kind of prices that will pay the extra cost of conservation. Uh, so that was one of the big um, challenges that we found on the way. We're not an NGO that works with agriculture. So the other challenge was how do we bring the agricultural experience to the conservation side? And that balance is, is what has been interested in this learning process uh, and bringing those bringing those partnerships you know, with the agricultural uh, development uh, sector with the conservation sector together to bring in these new models, bringing in the private sector as well into developing these new business models and together uh, being able to tap into those markets and being able to, to prove that we were actually uh, gaining, uh, reducing deforestation and then ending that circle with the ecosystem services market for carbon to pay for the extra cost uh, of conserving forests. Uh, the other part of the equation and linking it to, to the previous uh, discussion was that um, at the landscape scale, we're not only looking at coffee, we're also trying to see there is such rich cultural heritage in these landscapes and indigenous knowledge that we can also tap into. No? That's why we also brought this experience of these partnerships between private sector, agricultural development, uh, research centers, conservation NGOs into other kinds of products like I mentioned uh, briefly, the herbal teas, which are based on medicinal knowledge, medicinal plants and the knowledge of indigenous people and tapping into those uh, products to access other kinds of markets, which are more local, but are as important and uh, as um, an opportunity you know, as uh, coffee for export markets. And finally, uh, the other part of the equation is food security and how do we create resilient communities that when the, British, the, the big um, hits like uh, coffee rust hits, they're not left stranded with a lot of coffee and no alternatives. No? So we, we actually went through that, that process and learned uh, to also diversify coffee systems to include native plants uh, and food crops that are also important for their own livelihoods. And uh, um, for example, in indigenous communities, they were only using four or five manioc types of manioc. But there's like 30 types that we were able to tap into when we speak to elders and start promoting those as part of the system. So it basically, it's a lot about balance. It's a lot about uh, not uh, going to just uh, export markets or just one opportunity, but looking at the whole picture. Thank you. I, I, I think uh, uh, people also probably need to remember that uh, the first trade movement started in coffee. And uh, coffee was the first crop that started the fair trade movement and eventually it went out into the world. So we have a good... Uh, Dr. Um, Fan, uh, th there is a question on, on, on policy making. Uh, I know you want to answer the question of biotech, but that's a question that I leave in to the end for everyone. Um, how important is for um, policy making the independent reports that appear on scientific literature such as that good uh, review in, uh, on biodiversity. What is your opinion on these reports? And how do you, how do you suggest and advise governments to incorporate this in their policy making? Yeah, well, here in China, the China will host the COP15 on biodiversity. I think uh, uh, during this uh, summit, uh, some of the clear way forward policy strategies uh, will have to be developed. Uh, right now, we, we don't, it's not clear. Um, uh, for example, at the national level, how can they really mainstream the protection of biodiversity into their food system transformation? How can they mainstream protecting biodiversity in reforming subsidies? How to mainstream biodiversity in future technological innovations, institutional development? I think there are lots of work to do. But to me, the first is the, um, I think it's a campaign or the awareness. 
simply the citizens, the policymakers, including researchers, economists, they are not aware how dangerous we are in terms of losing our the crop, crop or animal biodiversity. So thank you. Lots work to do, and I think we got to work to. I think, to be frank, policymakers, economists, just begin to wake up. They they need to continue to do more. Thank you. When you say there is more work to do, I I, I wish I can have a time machine and and take me back when I was 20 to re, to be an agronomist again because the challenges that we face today are so uh, exciting that we need good agronomists, good biologists, good ecologists, and people who understand this. So I think challenges for the young generation. And this is and this is the last three questions that I have. But before I ask, I go to the last three questions. I want to ask the secretariat if they can share with us the results of the poll question. Can you share it with us? Uh, here, here, uh, here you have um, uh, the question of how much of global crop production volume comes from pollination dependent uh, dependent crops and. Uh, and and the question here, um, you can you can tell us. Um, hold on a second. I'm I'm getting old and I need my I need my notes. Um, basically, uh, you can. Thirty five percent of the people say that thirty five percent of the food production came from pollinators, and that's the correct answer. Uh, the correct answer is that not all the crops uh, really require the pollinators in the way we think. Only 35%, but those 35% are extremely important crops. The, the second uh, question uh, regarding of how much money is invested, uh, I think uh, uh, most of the people here is about 100 times more money is invested in, uh, in uh, other type of uh, in subsidies uh, or different type of subsidies than what it is invested on biodiversity. So that tells you that if we can do some sort of magic and use our resources, we can probably balance better subsidies with, uh, with, um, with uh, uh, investments in biodiversity. There are, there are three questions, at least two questions. And there are three, but I just want to save the time because I really would like everyone to, uh, to uh, make a contribution to these two questions. The first question is, uh, the same question that we asked in the previous panel. What about investment for everything that you suggested? What are your views on the investment? What is the investment going to come from? What type of investments we need? And the second question is probably more, um, more difficult and more, um, it probably caused more discussions around the question is, what is the role of the new technologies in all this? What is the role of uh, biotechnology? What is the role of CRISPR-Cas? What is the role of the new science on this issue of biodiversity? Uh, are we totally adults between biodiversity and the use of new technologies, for example, for drought resistance? Uh, and I would like to, to hear every one of our panelists uh, opinion on these two topics, as long as you want to speak, uh, that will be really enlightening for me. So if you want, if you want, we can start in the same order that we made the presentations. Uh, if that's the case, I would like to hear from uh, uh, Percy. What do you think of these two issues, Percy? What is investment coming from and what is the role of biotech that you have? You know, uh, we can dream about coffee, biotech coffee for uh, combating rust, uh, rust leaves uh, or, or rust production. So wh what are your opinion, guys? So, Go ahead, so, Terry. Yeah, thanks. Uh, first, uh, with regards to investment, I think um, more and more we're seeing uh, and we're being able to tap into private sector, into the private sector. And I think we need to do that uh, more aggressively and the private sector also has to make more bolder commitments because that's where the big the bigger uh, availability of funds are going to be 
Uh, so the more we can we can engage the private sector into sustainable food production, the better, uh, the more possibilities we are to make that transition, which is uh, um, much needed and at the scale that it's needed because we can keep tapping into public funds or development agencies, but that's we know those are limited funds and the, the scale that we need to make this transition is going to be only going to be able if we're going to be engage the private sector into investment into those kind of technologies into those kind of uh, production systems and towards the second uh, my thoughts are that um, there's no silver bullet uh, I think we need uh, to be creative we need to be innovative and we need all sectors to contribute to this innovation and biotech also has a role to play as much as that's traditional knowledge and all these other approaches have to converge, have to uh, create. These kind of dialogues are critical to creating those bridges that we need to for those uh, more interdisciplinary approaches, more integrated approaches to push forward. Um, and yes, I think those are my quick uh, reactions to those questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I think your answers really reflect the complexity of all this, uh, the challenges that we have in front. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Garvey, what, is you, what are your opinions on these topics? Uh, well, I have slightly different opinions uh, there. Uh, first of all, on the financing thing, uh, I'm rather worried about bringing in the big uh, players of the private sector into the financing of uh, uh, biodiversity. Uh, I have the impression that it will be hard to many times to make them compatible and then make them move in the way that we want. And um, often when we work with biodiversity, we also work with diversity of people in, in terms of many smallholders, people who are weak players in, in the value chains and trying to strengthen them and give them a place. And I believe that perhaps also when it comes to financing, we need to think more in terms of diversity thinking, being creative and seeing here, how can we raise uh, the capital needed or the funds needed from, uh, from uh, new or creative sources. But I think uh, going into the big uh, supernatural, uh, supernational um, multinational corporations for funding is not necessarily like, uh, likely to going to bring us where we need to go. Uh, it's going to focus a lot on how to make profits and focusing a lot on how to make profits will have to make us uh, make shortcuts on how to protect biodiversity and how to integrate uh, the people that uh, need to be included in the biodiverse value chains. When it comes to um, uh, biotech, uh, I personally am of the opinion that biodiversity is the antidote to, to uh, the needs that biotech tries to, to portray us as uh, needing. If you take drought resistance here in the Sahel, we have the drought resistance in the natural biodiversity. The problem we have is we've spent decades of uh, uh, as a humanity trying to grow crops where they weren't meant to be. So we're trying to force them in, into growing into different settings, different situations where they're not naturally adapted. What we can do and need to do is the exact opposite. Look at what are the plants, the species that are naturally adapted to these environments and use them and grow them and look at how do we use them instead of saying how do we grow the things we use that don't are not suited for here and in that sense we don't really need transgen uh, transgenic um, uh, interventions and so forth because we have this, the components we need in the environment we just need to understand the ecology and use the right components for the right things thank you uh, this i think is a reflection of the world we live. Thank you so much. Uh, um, Dr. Lovelock, what is your opinion on these two issues? Um, I'm, I, I think in, uh, for blue carbon at least, there is uh, immense enthusiasm. And um, in, in fact, I don't think there's a shortage of people or organizations that want to invest um, what I see is a problem of matching that investment with the kind of projects. And I have similar kind of misgivings 
uh, almost uh, as uh, Dr. Garvey. And um, I think, you know, investors want to invest a lot. And we want to do for Blue Carbon, we want to do community-based projects. And so sort of matching those two together, I think really needs new institutions or for, you know, and I think uh, Doc, one of the other panellists talks talked about, you know, uh, institutions that could basically aggregate money and then disperse it or finance and then disperse it at uh, an appropriate scale. So I, I think that's a really important thing for Blue Carbon, which is, you know, we want communities to be empowered. We don't want, you know, huge corporations planting monospecific stands of rhizophora all over the place, right? So um, I think if I had to talk about the uh, technological innovations, I think there is a really uh, big need for innovations around monitoring. Um, I think they're growing, uh, monitoring and um, uh, evaluating the impacts of restoration, being able to see whether restoration is successful or not. You know, so I, I think there's innovations to be made, not only in the biotech space, but in many other um, kinds of areas. Thank you. Uh, Luis, um, what are your, uh, your, your, your views on these two issues? How much um, uh, okay. is investment needed and the biotech in terms, which by the way, we haven't talked about biotech in animals which yeah. uh, could make them more efficient in the use of pastures and reduce methane emissions, at least what some people claim. So your views sure. on this. Okay, uh, uh, I'm not a, an, an expert on biotech, so my view is, um, uh, I would say, maybe biased. Uh, I know that there is a lot of research on that, like uh, uh, particularly here on the resilience of uh, some plant species. Um, and I think there is probably a role for uh, modified uh, uh, plants to, that, that actually uh, bring genes that are already in the biodiversity that we have uh, to, to, to help us to handle this um, climate change um, challenge. But I would like to talk about uh, or from of something that I know better, that's about the, the, the technology for um, uh, information and communication. And I think that's very important if you want people to know, to be aware of what the production systems are doing to the environment and uh, where they are, where they come from, where the, 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 the food come from, what the characteristics of them and uh, we, we can have now satellite, uh, we, we, we have like a interconnected world and uh, this is very important. There, there's quite a bit of technology available for people to know and then to make value out of it. Being political value for repressing uh, the, the governments or to uh, have like a, a financial or economic value in relation to the markets, the companies, so that the companies need to change the way that they do business in order to uh, to, to to supply for more aware people uh, of this kind of issues of biodiversity and climate change. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fun. The floor is yours. Yeah, as I said before. Uh, there's a huge subsidy right now, $700 billion. It's a big gorilla. Um, I mean, this subsidy is actually really destroy biodiversity. You know, they are promoting monocrops, you know, several stable crops, and uh, probably livestock. So can we repurpose the subsidy and use this money to invest? Invest, let's say, in building gym banks. And somebody asked me how we are going to preserve it's a the plant biodiversity or diversity. There are two ways. One is a so-called um, in situ and ex situ. So ex situ means you, you connect all these genes and put them in gene banks. We need much more investment to do that. You know, but 
even the local gene banks, the community gene banks, regional gene banks, provincial gene banks, national gene banks, global gene banks. So we can save the seeds somewhere for future use as you know, climate change will destroy some biodiversity. So we need to preserve that's number one. The second, the investment in, let's say in alternative proteins. You know, if we can produce proteins you know, both plant and animal proteins through through bioreactor. Then we don't need to destroy all this, you know, land pastures and so on. I think this is another game changing solution and that needs game changing investment. Now on biotechnology, I do think the biotechnology can help us to identify the different traits or different characteristics of certain crops or certain species. So we can save them, we can optimize our saving to maximize the diversity in our gene banks or the uh, institute, I forgot the institute, institute so, so smallholders play a huge role in preserving our natural seeds, our, our land races. But in right now they don't have any incentives. You know, can we pay them to compensate them if they save our treasures like seeds? You know, I, I think, um, part of investment can be used to support smallholders to preserve our seeds on their fields. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you, thank you to everyone. And before I pass the, the microphone to uh, my good co-host, uh, Ambassador Nosifu, I just want to, uh, to make some final comments if you allow me. Uh, I think during the afternoon and the morning hours, and certainly tomorrow, uh, this may be confirmed. The, the, the issue that we are dealing requires the intervention of governments, the intervention of the communities, the intervention of every one of us. The government need to start uh, updating, modernizing, and innovating in their public policies and investments and obviously uh, develop new innovative instruments for development. Uh, the scientific community has a very important role to play. Uh, we need to increase our knowledge. Uh, several of our speakers suggested that we need solid research, solid understanding. Investment is needed, but it may not be enough. We need, uh, we need uh, knowledge and, and the co-creation of knowledge with the participation of the, of the communities. And the communities, by definition, are the owners, are the keepers, and are the Sherpas in, in a good way uh, for the future of biodiversity. So I, I bring this from, from, uh, from the conversation. The conversation also made me realize that we need to create a new vision, the, the traditional vision of silos that uh, we established back in the 1940s and 50s is not enough. Today, we have to deal with the issues of sustainability, economic growth, nutrition, well-being, and that will require uh, a transformative way of thinking. And I think the international organizations can help us on that. Uh, we have a great opportunity to recover some of our orig original basic foods that are ancient people grew up and we have a tremendous opportunity. And I just uh, want to finish with two, with two uh, comments. One is that I really believe that the youth, and hopefully there are many of you listening to us, although you add my definition of youth, I define a young people, everyone that is one day younger than me, so there is plenty of young people around. Uh, but I, I think the young people have a tremendous role to play. We all people are getting, uh, have a big burden of knowledge and, and prejudices, and we need your view. You have a tremendous uh, opportunity, the world is yours, and I really truly believe in your leadership for the future. And, and then the final comment is, that I don't live here with an apocalyptic vision of catastrophe. I'm living here with a vision of hope, uh, listening to every one of you speaking today and reading most of the questions and the two, almost 300 participants give me hope for a better future. 
with this, uh, Madam Ambassador, I pass you the floor. Thank you, and thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Coche. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ambassador Miguel. And uh, I certainly agree with you uh, that uh, we have had a session where we've been enlightened, we've been enthused, uh, we have uh, uh, every reason to be hopeful and uh, certainly I agree that we, we live with a vision of hope and uh, uh, upbeat uh, uh, for the future. And our future generations will definitely uh, take the baton. And um, now, as we conclude the session, uh, just in sum to summarize, I first want to check uh, whether Terry Sack and Tanawa Moy uh, are you guys are you colleagues uh, available to start with a summary or should I begin? I I'm available to start. Please. With, uh, colleagues. Okay, is that Terry? Yeah. Yes, over to yes. you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, I've just seen uh, Tanawak come on screen. I, I'm just looking for him to just nod and say he's happy for me to continue with the summary. Yes, okay, great. Um, thank you. Uh, and thank you again to everybody for such, um, such a rich day of discussions. I've uh, really valued it. Um, as you heard this morning, um, I tried imperfectly to uh, summarize our discussions this morning. Um, and I'm going to have uh, another go this evening. Um, hopefully it'll be uh, a little bit better, but it still won't be perfect. Um, and uh, certainly we'll aim to have a, a more finished, polished version for, um, for you tomorrow. But um, our, I, so our, our chair's summary is going to be essentially two pages long. The first page, I'm not going to read out in detail because essentially it just documents the process that we've used today. I think the uh, substantive part of our summary are the key messages. Uh, and I'm proposing that I'll uh, read through those now um, uh, for everybody on the call. Um, and then of course, um, I know that the rest of the co-chairs may well indeed want to edit and update them uh, overnight. But here we go, here is our, uh, my second attempt, but really it's the first full attempt at summarizing the key messages from our dialogue today. So first of all, as I said this morning, um, the meat challenge, there, you know, there are real concerns. We've had real concerns in this dialogue about the impact of livestock production and wild meat consumption on biodiversity and climate. But we've also had real concerns about the future of small scale farmers and other producers who rely on livestock for their livelihoods or wild meat for their livelihoods. Uh, and we've also heard real concerns about um, you know, how some people actually need to eat more meat or more protein and others need to eat less uh, for their nutrition. Um, so it's a really, it's a challenge, as I've said, uh, and we need to find a balance. Um, and I think that was one of the main messages coming out of the discussion this morning. Um, secondly, um, and a key message, we need collective action to find that balance. And of course, that's why we're having this dialogue today. And we know the dialogue will continue in COP15, in COP26, the Food System Summit, Nutrition for Growth. Uh, and we've got plenty of opportunities to have that dialogue. Third key message, human rights depend on a healthy biosphere and human rights to life, health, food, healthy environment, water, and adequate standard of living and culture are threatened and violated by biodiversity loss. Um, when the rights of indigenous peoples, local communities and family farmers are recognized and protected, they can make enormous contributions to the sustainable use and conservation of biodiversity. Conversely, uh, under, key underlying factors driving deforestation include rising inequality and lack of clear tenure and land rights. Fourth key message, is around the value of biodiversity in food and agriculture systems. And these values include contributions to food security, to nutrition, to livelihoods, through sustainable use, uh, supporting the resilient production uh, and cult cultural and economic value. Fifthly, 
sustainable solutions and biodiversity practices, biodiversity friendly practices exist all around the world in all sectors. Um, and those are based on forgotten varieties of food sources um, and uh, agroecological and regenerative practices. They're also based on sustainable fisheries management. And there are solutions uh, to be identified that will need to be tailored to local and regional circumstances. And there is a real recognition there is scope for innovation, but uh, a key point coming from this morning was that there needs to be a market for the products that respond to biodiversity and climate challenges. Our next key message, number six, is that improved on-farm practices are not enough to achieve transformation at scale. We need partnerships that bring together actors, uh, all the actors from with a wide range of landscapes. Um, our seventh key message is action on production alone is not enough. We need a transition on the consumption side to more sustainable and healthy diets to create win-wins. Um, and national nutrition guidelines will have a key role to play here. Um, moving on to talk about transformative interventions to scale up biodiverse production systems. Um, so our eighth key message is that policies and markets are needed to support the transition to more biodiverse production, including interventions that push and pull, such as incentives, payments for ecosystem, ecosystem services and public procurement. Nine, financing. Um, is a key lever and the scale of investment that is required to transform landscapes and small scale biodiverse production is large, but the returns will be many times greater. Um, and uh, options, and this is one that's received quite a lot of attention, certainly this morning, and I heard some of it this, uh, this afternoon as well, is um, redirecting existing public support to agriculture, which can be harmful to biodiversity. Um, Blue carbon is another uh, potential option to incentivize the restoration and protection of mangrove systems. Our 10th key message is that we, we need to make the hidden costs of biodiversity loss and degradation visible within the food system. And uh, we heard this morning about how we really need metrics to measure biodiversity and monitor progress. And our final uh, message uh, from today is that we need to find a balance between efficiency and resilience in our food systems. Efficiency means affordable diets, but if global value chains are long, they can be vulnerable to shocks. Um, so those are our 11 key messages. As I said, they're not perfect and we are going to be working on improving them overnight. Um, but thank you very much and a huge thanks to, uh, which I forgot to say this morning, a huge thanks to all the team at FAO who have been supporting this dialogue, which has been a really uh, productive and uh, really useful. Um, I'm not sure who I should hand over to now. Shall I hand back to the, our co-chair? Gotcha. For... All right. Thank yes, you. Lovely. Thank you thank very you. much uh, for that. And uh... Again, uh, one would like to appreciate the, the summary uh, is reflective of uh, all the co-chairs. Uh, now I would like to give uh, an opportunity to Tanawa to uh, make one comment uh, uh, in less than five minutes, if possible. And then I will make my comment and hand over to my final co-chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassadors. Actually, I would like to say that uh, Terry uh, did a great job to summarize uh, the issues that we discussed uh, in the morning. But anyway, I would like to emphasize some particular issues that uh, we know that um, the loss of uh, biodiversity is considered is, uh, as one of the main global threats and our well-being is highly uh, dependent on by all diversities. And we need your commitment and actions. And in the capacities of the chairperson of the Committee on World Food Security, CFS, I would like to uh, encourage you 
to read uh, the recent uh, endorsed policy recommendation on agroecological and other innovative approaches, and also the voluntary guideline on food system and nutrition, both policy products that CFS endorsed this year, also mentions about the role of biodiversity is an important of biodiversity in our food system and also the agroecological and other innovative approach. Uh, it will be an, another instrument uh, to, help, to help us preserve and secure our biodiversity. And the other uh, CFS policy products on uh, uh, principle for uh, responsible investment in agriculture and food system is another policy products that we need to uh, ensure that the investment in agriculture and food system need to address the issues of conservation of our biodiversity at the national level and global level. And this message that I would like to share with all of you Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Ambassador. I over the floor to you. Thank you, thank you, Tanawa. And uh, uh, certainly, uh, colleagues, uh, we, you have uh, covered uh, the summary and we, one would just want to make a small addition from the observations uh, this afternoon. Um, uh, in particular, if I may, uh, I wanted to thank uh, again this opportunity uh, to co-facilitate the session uh, on the topics that are close to my interest. Uh, and as a South African uh, coming from a country which has got both a vast hinterland and a long coastal line, uh, I've had uh, in the, uh, in, during this afternoon session inspiring case studies and reports from experts and uh, which also included reflections from practitioners that highlighted the importance of the interplay and or interface between agriculture, agricultural practices and natural ecosystems. Uh, that interplay is also was further elucidated with aspects of uh, terrestrial and uh, a fresh uh, aqua, aquatic and coastal ecosystems um, in a manner that underlined or underscored the need for joint and integrated planning. Um, that is one aspect that I think um, in summary we need to lift uh, because there was a recognition that both in terms of agricultural planning mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and uh, as well as conservation planning we tend to have uh, silos and there is no right. real integration in respect of that uh, uh, of planning um, for sustainability. The role open ended working group for the post 2020. underpinning production processes in agriculture and food systems and the practical approaches uh, uh, were utilized in terms of making a case for ecosystem-based approaches. I mean, more, I'm more enlightened after today's session. Um, it, and in essence, uh, I think one of the key messages was taking care and respecting nature. Um, we have an opportunity to frame transitions for food production systems that would achieve food security with less consumption and less wastage. Um, again, these were um, uh, aspects that one uh, uh, is making a reflection in the context of um, impacts of climate change, um, the outlined loss of biodiversity and ecosystem re resilience. So I take this opportunity again to say thank you and uh, what has come out of today would begin to inform an ambitious uh, program of uh, that would inform the, both the UN Food Systems Summit as well as the COP26 uh, input on adaptation and mitigation for climate change and the CBD COP, COP15 
and other forms of the UN bodies, whether it's the UN governing council. These are the messages that we need to take out there and make sure that uh, we, we really mainstream uh, the, the outcomes of the dialogue uh, in the context of the role of food uh, and agriculture in global biodiversity framework. Thank you very much. And I would like to hand over to my co-chair to conclude. Thank you very much. I wonder if you can hear me because uh, when you depend on technology, the batteries go out on your microphones and uh, that happened to me, but thank you so much. I, before, before I finish, I, I just want first to uh, thank, express my sincere appreciation to all our interpreters. Our interpreters are in the back room and we don't know them, but without their work, uh, this could not be possible. So uh, a, a big hand to, to you and also to the Secretariat for uh, helping us. We have a lot of people working in FAO that we don't see them, but without their work, this could not be possible. Uh, as, as, I, as I mentioned it at, at, at my last remark, I believe that the challenges of today will require new ideas, and I strongly believe we have uh, a, the possibility to create a new, a new world and a better world. I, Eventually, I will review these comments, uh, but overall, I agree. I think we need to be more intelligent. We need to work together. And I think the main challenge is how do we bridge the differences? Uh, as I tell my colleagues here in Rome, I think if we find one common issue that brings us together, we will be able to bring, to create a better world. If we look in what divides us, then we will make this world probably worse. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. This is a good welcome for me at FAO. And uh, I appreciate uh, my co-host and my co-chairman. Uh, and uh, thanks again. Uh, let's hand over to the secretary. Thank you, uh, Ambassador, and uh, again, uh, good afternoon to all. I would like uh, to thank our co-chairs. I think they have done a tremendous job to bringing us together, to facilitate the debate, and helping us to come up with uh, the outcome which they presented uh, now, but it will be, as I said, refined and presented tomorrow. I just wanted to give you some um, outline what will be our session and our day tomorrow. But let me thank the co-chairs, thank our panelists, our FAO colleagues who behind the scenes, they organize these two days of uh, discussion and also our interpreters who facilitate this dialogue, putting us all together and understanding each other. The, um, Tomorrow we have, let me say, three main uh, moments. The first one will be with the keynote speakers. Uh, we have the Shuntala Tilstead, who is the World Food Prize winner 2021. Uh, we have also the former president of Mauritius, who is a biodiversity scientist. Uh, Mrs. Bibi Amina Gurib Fakim. And then uh, will the co-chairs will uh, present the interim report on the outcomes of the global dialogue today. Then we have a second moment, which will be uh, the status of the development of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework will be a contribution to the third meeting of the open-ended working group for the post-2020. Uh, I think it will be a good contribution. Uh, and there we'll be having FAO governing bodies in a panel. We have the, the chair of the different committees, agriculture, forests, and fisheries. Also the treaty on plant genetic resources and international plant protection convention. This will be our morning se uh, session. Then in the afternoon, we'll be having a more political and high-level dialogue where we'll be having uh, 
the current chair of COP14, the upcoming chair of COP15. We'll be having the de deputy ministers from Mexico and Colombia. Mexico organized the COP13. Uh, Colombia will be organizing the open-ended group. We'll be having the two commissioners from uh, agriculture, uh, from um, African Union and uh, uh, European, uh, European Commission. Uh, we'll be having representatives from the UN and also from World Bank and IFAD, where then the co-chairs again will present the final uh, summary where we'll be integrating the contribution coming from the high level discussions. And with that, we'll be closing our today's meeting. Uh, I think uh, we have been very ambitious, but you have been able to make it. As it has been said, I think is a turning point for us in FAO. It will be a great contribution, how we'll see the contribution of biodiversity in better producing, in better consuming, but also to bring up the economics of biodiversity. And I think this will help us to make smarter choices where we'll see what kind of production systems we'll be choosing. But with this, I would like again to thank you all. I would like to thank all our participants who has been with us since this morning. We still have more than 200 participants with us. See you tomorrow morning at 10.30 and have a restful evening. Thank you again. Bye-bye to all.